All right, we're live. So hello, everybody. My name is Joanna here, if you're new here, and this is the Why Read discussion, discussion series, and we are on episode number 20. So today, we are the three J's today, because we have Jared, Jordan, and of course, I am Joanna. And before I even ask uh, these two wonderful channel, uh, Jordan and Jared, how they are doing, I'm going to start with the Why Read question, because that's why we're here. So this is a why read discussion because we always start with that question and this is a question about what inspires you right now to pick up a book when there are so many things in life competing for our attention whether it's watching youtube or whether it's playing a game if you play games or whether it's watching a show or doing any other distraction or pastime what inspires you right now to pick up a book and so starting off with jared um, I, you know, I, I think I've never had to think too hard about why I would start reading um, or why I would keep reading because it's just been a part of my life for so long. But the, I think if I have to give a sort of justification for it, it's just that reading has been a constant source of both like intellectual stimulation and entertainment in my life in a way that like no other media has. You know, I like I can watch some TV. I don't watch a ton of it. I can play some video games. I don't play a, a lot of them. And I often kind of feel like I just like wasted some time because it's not always um, giving me what I'm looking for. Uh, I very rarely feel that with reading um, and I read a pretty wide range of things. And it's still, I just never feel that whether I'm reading manga or whether I'm reading fantasy or whether I'm reading philosophy, just all the time, I feel like I'm getting something good out of it. Oh, that's an amazing answer. Cause it's true. I mean, even you know, there are obviously various genres when it comes to reading. And I know you read philosophy, as well as classics, as well as science fiction and fantasy, you, re you read a wide array of genres. And yet, I love what you said that even like, if you're reading manga, it never feels like a waste of time, like, there's a waste of time, which or it's frivolous for any reason. So I totally agree with that. <laughs> and what about you, Jordan? Yeah, I'm I'm with Jared. I think that's a really good way of putting it. Um, maybe this is like a pathological thing with me, but I do feel like when I'm not, when I'm doing something like if I'm scrolling on my phone or I'm playing games, I, I do feel like when I'm not reading, I feel like I'm wasting my time or when I'm not spending time with people when I'm not reading. Uh, so that's true. For, for me, uh, reading changed the trajectory of my life. I would say actually that it reading saved my life. Hopefully that's not a uh, syrupy or overly melodramatic thing to say. Uh, when I started really taking reading seriously, I was lost in life. Um, you know, I, I had no purpose. And I mean that literally. I was um, a teenager. I was angsty and I was drifting. Um, and when I started reading, it suddenly started to feel like I had a purpose. Um, where I grew up, everything around me felt so dull and banal. Uh, um, and uh, then when I started reading, it almost felt like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the, um, the film Pleasantville. Uh, it's this, <laughs> you know, Tobey Maguire and William H. Macy and uh, Reese Witherspoon. Uh, it's this movie where people are stuck in this old uh, TV sitcom, this black and white world. Uh, and everything's just this 1950s, pleasant, repressed, suburban ennui. And then suddenly color starts to bloom uh, in the world. And that's kind of what it was like for me. I realized that reading wasn't this solitary, uh, cloistered thing that you do. And then you like never leave your house and you have cats everywhere and you become a uh, disheveled recluse uh, that can't relate to anyone. What I realized when I started reading is that these books were actually enhancing my world. They were bringing color and life to my world. Um, there's, a, there's a great uh, poem by William Wordsworth, uh, Tintern Abbey. Uh, it actually has a longer title, but pe most people call it Tintern Abbey. And the speaker essentially the whole time is talking about the way in which nature and having experiences in nature, that it's not this isolated thing. Um, he says that even when you're away from nature for a long time, he says that um, oft mid the din of, um, oft mid lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them, 
ode to them, he means the figures, the forms of nature. Uh, he says, in hours of weariness, sensation sweet that lingers in the blood and passes along the heart into his purer mind. And what he's talking about is the fact that when he goes and has these excursions in, in nature, uh, it lingers with him. And that when he goes out into the world and he speaks to people, uh, there's a kind of tranquil restoration and the, the weight, the weary weight of all the unintelligible world is lightened for him. And at the end of the poem, he says that nature allows him to see into the life of things. So for me, th that's how I feel about reading. It's a superpower. Um, you know, that's what it did for me when I was young, and that is what it continues to do for me today. I would add, lastly, that I'm also an escapist, so I certainly also agree with, you know, George R. R. Martin when he says that uh, a, a reader lives a thousand lives, the man who doesn't read lives only once or something like that. Um, so part of it is that when I read, especially fiction, I get to escape uh, and I'm transported to, you know, I'm sailing the wine dark seas with Odysseus or I'm, 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 I'm floating down the Mississippi with Jim and Huck on a raft. And so it enables you to step into other people's shoes. I know that's, that's, a, uh, that's a cliche, but, um, you know, to put it in a more sophisticated way that Jared would probably appreciate, philosophers often talk about consciousness and qualia and what it's like to see a sunset from Jared's perspective or for, from Joanna's perspective. Reading enhances what it's like to do everything in life. It, it, it enhances the way that you see other people. You get to see a sunset in a different way. After you read Charles Dickens with all of his beautiful characters, you begin to see those qualities in people uh, in your life. So I'll leave it at that. I've already talked too long, but that's just like what it does for me. It gives me a kind of, it feels like it just enhances every moment in my life. Ah, that's so beautifully said. I love what you were saying about that poem too. And what you just said too, about the power of literature to kind of give us these different perspectives. You said, uh, what is the quali? <laughs> I can't say it now. Qu qualia. Yeah. Just qualia. The, that inner uh, subjective quality of experience that's that that is unique to each of us, like the way that it feels for you to look at a sunset, jo Joanna, uh, as Thomas Nagel would have it, I'm cognitively close to that, but it feels like when I read, I'm not. And I just think that's really beautiful. Mm, yeah, when you were talking about that, immediately brought to my mind Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, because it's the Pastoral Symphony and the way that he depicts nature through music is such a profound experience for me personally. <laughs> Um, I feel like he just captured exactly how passionate, how he felt about it, how strong, you know, in the same way that you're talking about that poem. And it's just amazing to feel like you could connect to that through that experience through, even if you really can't, there's a feeling like you can. So it's mm -hmm. like you said, and I'm curious, Jared, because you said that you haven't thought much about why you read, but you actually did. One of the first videos I ever saw of yours was this amazing video. And I think you were talking about teleology, and I'm so bad. I've mispronounced everything, so I apologize. And I think that was what you were saying in the video about the importance of not putting so much emphasis on what or how much you read, but more about the quality and about why you're reading. So I thought it was mm -hmm. interesting that you brought that up because I had just started the series at the time and I thought, he gets it. This is like why I'm starting this series. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, if you're saying that in some video I talk about teleology or like Aristotle, that's about 70% of them at this point. But, uh, but I think I know what you mean. Like, uh, I had like some early videos where I talked about like, you know, I, I do have a video called like how to read more. But like my, my, one of the things I, I really strongly believe is that actually, the quality of your reading is significantly more important than the quantity of your reading. That it's, it's actually why I've stopped setting like number goals for my reading per year or anything like that. Um, just because I want to get myself out of that sort of um, quantitative mindset and, and focus more on the qualitative experience of reading. Um, and also to just think about like what reading does for you as a person, because I do, I do worry that when you, I mean, this was happening to me, right? I, it's, it's not just like that I'm worried people, others will do this. It was happening to me when I would set really ambitious reading goals, um, to read like a hundred books in a year or something like that, which is, which is pretty fast for me. Um, and I've never been able to do uh, hit triple digits, uh, digits. Um, what I found is that closer to the end of the year, I would start picking like really short books, not because I really wanted to read them, but because I knew I could read like two of them in a day if I like really read fat, you know, it was, it was things like that. And I, and, and when I got to the end of that experience, I realized like, what was the point of reading those books? Like, what was the point of doing it? What did it give me? 
did I even enjoy it? So like one, I didn't even, I didn't even enjoy it. And it gave me nothing like as a person, I didn't get to like grow in any capacity. So to, to worry about the numbers too much um, really ended up kind of being destructive for the way I was thinking about reading. And so, and I think for a lot of people, it's like, I think that's a really common trap. Every time I say this, there will be someone, I wouldn't be surprised if there were someone in the chat who's like, well, I love setting a reading goal. It motivates me. Okay, great. Fine. That's cool. I, I never want to take that away from you if it works for you. However, I just think there is a tendency for this kind of uh, focus on the numbers to really, um, uh, uh, to, to, to really kind of harm you as, as a reader. And, you know, I saw someone in the chat ask, like, since you guys are talking about this kind of high minded stuff, what do you think about like popcorn fiction or something? I mean, look, I'm like, I'm reading one piece right now uh, and it's like a lot of fun. And my, my, my view of this stuff is that it's just part of a balanced diet in the same way that like you generally like want to like be healthy, how you eat and stuff. It doesn't mean like you can never have popcorn right? or like you can never have candy or something, something like that. You just like want to put it in its kind of place in a, like a, in a much more robust and sort of fully fleshed out um, way of way of reading, which is why I try to read so widely. It's why I read philosophy and science fiction and fantasy and history and all of this stuff. And I try to mix and mingle all, all of that stuff to make me a more well-rounded person. Uh, beautifully said. I totally agree with all of that. And I think there's a place for all types of reading as well. It seemed like I missed a question here. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Evie was asking Jordan, since you're quoting Woodsworth, what are your thoughts on John Keats? Uh, what are my thoughts? Um, I love John Keats. I think he's a brilliant poet. Um, he died tragically so incredibly young. Um, he was kind of a fanboy of all of the other uh, poets. Um, I like his, his ode on a Grecian urn. That's Keats, right? I teach that poem. Why am I asking if it's Keats? Um, but, uh, I, I love Keats and I, I like some of the young romantics. So that whole generation of poets that came after the sort of OG romantic poets, Wordsworth and Coleridge, you know, I love Shelley and, uh, Byron and, uh, and uh, and Keats and um, but I also like William Blake and and stuff like that. I think Keats is brilliant and tragically died. So yeah, I think he was 26 when he died. I think he died of tuberculosis. Um, he was also a tiny man, a very very little man. He's like five foot three or some five foot one. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't I don't know. He's not I guess my favorite romantic poet, but um, but uh, I do like him. So. It does seem to be a favorite here. <laughs> so that's pretty exciting. Um, fantastic. Yeah, so I was wondering, oh, the, here we go. Correct answer. <laughs> it was a loaded question since I'm obsessed with Keats. All right. And, oh, wow, five, he was shorter than I am. That's pretty oh, impressive. <laughs> 25, tuberculosis, five feet tall. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Was it Keats? Uh, tell me she was only Evie. Was it Keats that wrote, I love the poem on looking into Chapman's Homer. That was Keats, right? I get them all, swir they're swirling around in my mind. That's a beautiful, beautiful poem. And that's very relevant to what we're talking about. This, the, the feeling that you have when you first, when you, Keats was talking about reading uh, this first very naturalistic translation of Homer's Odyssey that really makes you that really brings the poem to life. And he was, he wrote a, uh, the, the poem was about how it felt, speaking of, of qualia, how it felt to, to dive into that poem, um, that, that epic. Um, so. Yeah, beautifully said. So I'm curious though, since you both are, obviously you have a lot of knowledge on philosophy as you've both shared on your channels. Do you find that having a knowledge base of philosophy has enhanced your reading of fiction? And if so, how? <laughs> what do you think, Jared? I mean, I, I mean somewhat. Um, in some ways, learning too much philosophy can turn you into a pedantic jerk. And, um, and it can be like that, actually becoming a specialist in almost anything. So, uh, um, but, uh, you know, philosophy might have a, a particularly strong tendency to turn you into a pedantic jerk, which can mean you can be a little less forgiving of, of the author when you're reading or this tendency to nitpick or something like this. Um, and, you know, philosophers can often be accused of sort of missing uh, the forest for the trees. And I think that can be true when you're reading fiction as well. Um, but at the same time, what philosophy did for me um, was really to increase like my critical capacities. So, you know, it's, uh, I think like the best argument for going to graduate school in philosophy 
is that it will like genuinely make you into a better thinker in the sense of like your ability of like imagining like robust alternatives of like to, of ways of thinking uh, it can be really powerful. And this is also beneficial when you're like doing anything with, related to fiction, whether it's reading it or writing it. You know, there's this thing that I talk about a couple times on my channel and I just bring up in conversation a lot. It's the last chapter of Bertrand Russell's Problems of Philosophy. And Bertrand Russell is like, you know, he was a logician, he was a mathematician. He wanted to ground all of logic and all of mathematics into logic. And he had this like real um, like mathematical mind. And yet he writes this, this book, this introductory book, which is very dry sometimes. It's very analytical. And then the last chapter is like the value of doing philosophy and the thing he teaches you is that like philosophy robs you of your certainty and makes you realize that the world is basically weird and wonderful and that's awesome and like it's almost this like poetic ending to this very analytical book uh and i think that like philosophy lets you see that about the real world as well but also like fiction does that too and you see these things as like both kind of expanding the sort of range of your imagination and so that you can just deem plausible a significantly broader range of possibilities. Yeah. That's beautifully said. What about you, Jordan? Yeah, I identify with a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> for me, philosophy, so I, I did two bachelor's degrees, one in philosophy and one in English. I had to get the second one to go to grad school for teaching English to become a high school English teacher. So um, I'm with Jared on that. I think more than anything, you would think that, and yes, like, the meanest comments I ever get on on YouTube are when I make a video that touches on anything related to philosophy. Uh, in fact, I'm trying to figure out how to deal with this angry stalker uh, right now uh, and how to like handle that. And I think that's probably the bigger your channel gets, the more that you have to deal with those sort of things. Um, but uh, I, I think Jared's right. Actually, paradoxically, the more I study philosophy, the more uncertain I am about everything. And the more I realize, I know it's, again, kind of cliche, but the more I realize, the more I learn, the re more I realize I, I don't actually know. And the less fully certain and dogmatic I become. Um, but I would say, you know, it depends what kind of philosophy we're talking about. So when I majored in philosophy, it was a harder degree than my English degree was. In English, and I'm not trying to insult anyone, a lot of it was sitting around in a circle and just chit chatting about the books we had read. And then the course, you write a couple of papers and the course is over. Philosophy, I had to take two courses in logic. I had to take ancient Greek philosophy and modern philosophy. And I took a course on Heidegger. And, um, and so the reading was like hundreds of pages, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages a week. And it was very rigorous. And so if anything, it sharpened, I think it sharpened my mind. Um, so I think philosophy does have the power to do that, but it also depends what type of philosophy we're talking about. Jared is the, you know, the ultimate philosopher, so he would know this better than any of us, but, you know, there are two major branches of philosophy, like right now that, you know, people dip into, which is analytic philosophy and continental philosophy. When you read continental philosophies, uh, philosophy, um, folks like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and, you know, uh, Camus and, you know, um, Merleau-Ponty and, you know, some of these uh, other uh, philosophers, Schopenhauer, uh, Hegel, stuff like that. It's more literary. You know, Nietzsche is a literary writer. He writes in these like pithy little aphorisms and these Dionysian dithyrams. And it's very literary. He was a beautiful, beautiful writer. And so I would say in some ways, it, majoring in philosophy gave me even more of an appreciation going back and reading someone like Plato. When you read the Republic, it reads like a work of dystopian fiction. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, sometimes I don't know if there's a line. Uh, and so I guess what it's done for me and my channel is, uh, knowing about these big ideas, I kind of, I, maybe this isn't even a good thing, but I kind of filter what I read through some of these big ideas, the great conversation of, of history. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I look for that in my books. Or I read works of fiction like uh, Bruce Duffy's The World As I Found It. Jared was just talking about uh, Bertrand Russell. Uh, that book is all about um, Bertrand Russell and that whole uh, Bloomsbury group and that whole circle of intellectuals. It's, a, it's an, an amazing book. Um, but uh, there are works of literary or philosophical literature uh, as well. So I would say that it just has enhanced the experience of reading things like fiction. I love that. I love that so much. It's funny just to um, piggyback on what you guys were saying. I 
was very close to a philosopher at one point. I actually got really into philosophy for a short while. I'm not very knowledgeable on the subject by any means, but I remember getting really into it and being curious about Kant and about this philosopher and that philosopher. And the person, he was actually my boyfriend at the time, was a, he actually had a degree in philosophy and he was a big Bertrand Russell fan. But I remember asking him about this, I'm like, well, what about this? And what about this? And he said, well, that person was wrong. And I was like, but what about what Kant said about this? Well, that person was wrong. I'm like, well, was anybody right about anything? He's like, well, no. <laughs> Be and careful. I'm like, Be careful dating those philosophy majors. I know. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, actually. Uh, it was a great learning experience, though. I just I realized, wow, I mean, this isn't really what philosophy is about, is it? And it's interesting because I just watched a video recently. I don't know if you two know the channel. Let me look up his channel name. Robin Walden. Do you either of you know that yeah, channel? Know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so I, was watching yeah him. I, I know Robin's channel. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. He has a really he had a really great video about uh, a book called Metaphysical Animals. And he was talking about kind of like what happened to philosophy in the 20th century and how it almost became a thing of the past or a study of the past, I guess, to a I'm paraphrasing, of course, but that uh, that all changed in World War II. And I'll, I won't go into depth about what he said there. It was a really interesting video. I highly recommend checking it out. But he talked about how the focus of, I guess, maybe continental philosophy, I'm not sure, but the focus of philosophy would be to understand the world more through thinking or to not to go towards precise answers so much, but to... Um, but to grapple with these harder questions. And in doing so, and I think this kind of speaks to what you were saying, Jared, in doing so, you actually make yourself a better critical thinker and it kind of reforms you as a person, even if you never get to any certain answers, that there is actually value for maybe the individual going through that process or for some individuals. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would just say a couple of like historical notes about like the, the philosophy stuff, because I, I think I have a slightly different view of this. So one is like, I'm not willing to cede like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and stuff to, to the continental thinkers because the split between continental and analytic philosophy really kind of occurs in the late 19th century where we get the split between the logicians basically and the phenomenologists. And that's where it kind of, kind of occurs. Now it's true that the, the continental schools tend to be the ones that go back and read Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and stuff that gets labeled as late modern philosophy that's post-Kantian German philosophy in particular. Uh, that part's that part's cer certainly true, um, but one thing that did happen because of the move of splitting kind of into the sort of analytic schools and then the phenomenological stuff is that ph phenomenologists kind of begin with like understanding what it, what what gives rise to the possibility of having experiences. Some people talk about phenomenology as like critically understanding your own experiences. It's actually not quite right. It does it does it doesn't do it justice. It's like, what would the world and ourselves have to be like for it to be possible for us to have experiences at all? And like, that's like one of the, one of the first questions they're asking. Now, because of that, it's that like subjective and intersubjective uh, aspect of life that like the uh, phenomenologists and then the people who are inspired by them, the existentialists and things are like, are like this, really want to focus on. But there's always this push and pull of understanding our own experiences, understanding our uh, experiences as not just subjective beings, but intersubjective beings where we can enter into these kinds of relations. Hegel talks about sort of the understanding the self actually through the, the recognition of the other and, 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 and these sorts of things. And then what happens with, and, and something kind of strange happens is that a lot of those thinkers end up in um, English departments and a lot of those thinkers end up in uh, sociology departments. And then philosophy really was heavily influenced by uh or like the philosophy departments became analytic departments by by and large not exclusively but by and large and they really saw themselves as more continuous with the sciences and mathematics mm -hmm. and so like in the in the graduate department i went to which is a fantastic place to do philosophy and it's changed a little bit since i left but when i was there um we had a thing called the logic group that was one-third mathematicians one-third philosophers and one-third linguists and then like one or two psychologists came every once in a while, you know, uh, with that, and that was like really common. And I spent a lot of time in the, in the, in the logic group. And um, that was like, that was just seen as kind of normal. Now, one of the reasons for this actually has to do with the way that certain academics um, were expelled from certain parts of Europe, um, especially in um, Germany. World War II was actually this really transformative thing where we got a bunch of logicians into the U.S., uh, from Germany because they were mostly expelled for 
um, particularly being Jewish, actually, it was like during the, the rise of the Nazis. And, and this happens where like, they have a huge influence on, on philosophy because of that and like logic and stuff. Like that kind of stuff just played a really big, a big and important impact. But either way that you go, sorry to di- divert into this weird kind of tangent about the 20th century philosophy, but either way that you go, whether or not you're focusing on kind of intersubjective experiences and things, or focusing on logical analysis of like language or of concepts themselves or anything like this, no matter what, what you're going to find is that when you think deep enough about them, nothing is what it appears initially. <laughs> the idea that the world kind of just is like given to us in its full richness is actually that that belief does not survive scrutiny basically um because we will always there's just always more to discover there are always new problems and paradoxes to kind of untangle Mm, fantastic well that's fascinating i I do want to learn more about this topic by the way (laughs) sorry go ahead jordan yeah i i appreciate everything jared said and i've always kind of agreed with that i've always thought that the split between continental and, and analytic philosophy was a little bit was a little bit arbitrary, um, and um, but I, I guess speaking of of, of literature, uh, and you brought up you know phenomenology and things like that, and um, I I always get made fun of this, but I really like the existentialists. Um, I've I've always really liked the fiction of Camus and Jean Paul Sartre, and um, I really see them as, in some sense, setting aside the most of the problems of philosophy that had kept philosophers going since Plato puzzles about whether or not things are real and how we can know anything for certain. The idea, one of the things I like about existentialism is the fact that it seems to me to be a kind of old school wisdom philosophy where it's a, it's questions about life and how to live, uh, the existential notion is the idea that we're thrown, we're already thrown into a world with, you know, uh, filled with things. And so maybe now we need to get back to more down to earth matters. How do we live in this world? Um, You know, we can bracket for the moment, these, some of these deep questions about like, you know, uh, object metaphysics and identity over time. And um, do I even exist in the first place, man? Um, But uh, I've always liked the existentialists given the fact that they, we're asking deep questions about how, what is the good life? How do we live in the world? Um, you know, uh, what is what is responsibility? What is freedom? Uh, things like that. In fact, I so don't like the arbitrary divisions of philosophy that I did my undergraduate honors thesis on comparing Schopenhauer's The World as Will in representation to the, Indi- the ancient Indian philosopher Vasubandhu's Trisva Bhava Nardesha, which is the treatise on the three natures. So I like comparative philosophy. I, might, I like mixing analytic philosophy with continental um, and, um, and that sort of thing. And I agree with Jared's, uh, Jared's uh, not lecture, uh, lesson on the, on the history of, of, of philosophy. Diatribe yeah, might be the way it works. It's all good. <laughs> fascinating stuff. Um, So I actually find myself really drawn towards existential themes in fiction. So I find that to be something that is interesting. And then what you were saying, by the way, what you did your thesis on, uh, Jordan, it's interesting to me too, because I made mention of this before on my channel, even though I know the the composer is problematic, I do love the opera Tristan and Untisolda by Wagner. Um, I took a whole oh, class I love on Wagner. it. Wagner. Yeah. I'm Jewish I, and I love Wagner. Not the man, oh, really? but. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not the man, but the music is incredible. But I took classes. Uh, oh, don't, don't let scumbags ruin their art for you. Like, yeah. like the fact that they made good art, even though they were bad people, is like a gift to us. And then we can be like, haha, we don't have to like you, even though we love your stuff. It's fine. Totally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's how I feel about it. Because his, I mean. He was sexist. He was racist. He was, there were so many problems with Wagner, but um, I really, really love that opera and studying that opera. We always talked about uh, the will as the world as will and representation and how it was driving. It was an underlying theme or force in that opera. But I also had a professor who talked about the Hindu influence in that opera as well. And there was like a statement, for example, where um, Tristan, the main character says, I myself am the world. Like the love potion isn't just a love potion. It's more like an enlightenment kind of potion, I guess is the way it's being interpreted by some. 
but it's just fascinating stuff. So I got excited when I found out that you did your thesis on that. Yeah, I find that kind of stuff fascinating. I guess I would say this. I really like intellectual history. So I just I just love studying about the chain of ideas and how they spread. For example, um, you know, like Socrates learning from the pre-Socratic philosophers, then Socrates being the teacher of Plato, then Plato being the teacher of Aristotle, then Aristotle being the teacher of Alexander the Great, and then Alexander the Great spreading Hellenism and classical antiquity throughout everywhere. Um, and so I, I, I just like that kind of thing. You can do a similar thing with German idealism, Schopenhauer leading to Nietzsche, Nietzsche leading to existentialism and postmodernism. I just love intellectual history. I like talking about it. I like just the interplay of ideas and I like books that kind of do that as well. Um, so. Yeah. It's just so fascinating to me though. Like whenever I learn something about philosophy, cause like I am not on the level <laughs> obviously of my two guests here, but anytime I learn something and then I can kind of make a connection to something I'm reading is mm -hmm. really cool to me. I just think it's really cool. Um, or just to explore that a book on well, that's that level. One the, that's one of the reasons I l actually love your channel is that, you're just very, this quality of being open and approaching things with this intellectual wonder. Um, and I really like that about your channel. And I love, um, here I, I sound again, I sound syrupy. I love Jared's channel as well. I'm new to Jared's channel, but I just think the amount that Jared does in like 12 minutes or like 13 minutes, the amount that he says, the amount that he takes his viewer through, um, I was just uh, listening to his uh, 10 philosophy books like half of which I'd never even heard of. So Jared's read a lot more philosophy than I have. Uh, and his 10 favorite books. And his 10 favorite book list had, th a lot of those are my favorite books. So I feel uh, intellectual uh, kindred spirits here, Jared. Yes. And by the Thank way, Jared, that video was yeah. excellent. That one, you mentioned a book called, and hopefully YouTube doesn't mind me saying it, On Bullshitting. <laughs> oh, and yeah, I am really- That's a yeah. great book. Is it? Oh, that's fantastic. I got excited about yeah. um, when you talked about that book and about the difference between lying and bullshitting, because everyone knows here, probably if you've been around, one of my favorite books is John Williams Stoner. And there is specifically mm -hmm. a character in that book who is definitely a bullshitter, <laughs> like mm -hmm. classic. Yeah, yeah. The dissertation scene, yeah. if you, anybody has read. You the book. can read you can you, you can read that uh, that Frankfurt book in an hour probably maybe two uh, if you want to go a little bit slow it's super short they sell it at bookstores in like a little hardback that's like this big um oh, wow. it looks almost kind of cute yeah I've got it right so, there. Uh, it's basically just an essay it's just like a, an essay that happened to get published funnily enough wow. frankfurt then wrote a follow-up called on truth that i think sold like a third of the copies <laughs> you know everyone everyone oh everyone how funny and then and they never thought on truth was worth it yeah. It's never, it's not as catchy or clickbaity of a title kind no, of thing. No, on bullshit, such a good title. It's such a good title. Yeah. 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 Well, when you see it in the store, it's this little tiny little chap book. It's like this little, it's got a red in the center and blue and it's, I think it's cloth bound and then it looks really fancy. And then it, you know, you get closer to it and it says on bullshit and you're like, this isn't a fancy book. And then you read it and yes, it is a fancy book. Um, and I, I actually watched that video where you were talking about that, Jared, uh, Frank, for, for anyone listening that uh, hasn't read that book yet, um, and Jared could probably give a better summary than I could, but that book is about the difference between truth tellers, so people who are honest and try to tell the truth, uh, liars, people who know what the truth is and then deliberately conceal it because, in fact, they know what the truth is. So paying respect to the truth, they therefore have to uh, – cover it up and make you believe the opposite or whatever. And then bullshitters, this new category or classification of person who pays no respect to the truth, who doesn't care what's true at all, who just kind of says things to get their way in the world or says things to gain power or, and so he says that his whole thesis is that bullshitters are the worst of the three because at least liars have to know what the truth is, pay heed to it, in order to then conceal it from the people that they're speaking with. Whereas bullshitters don't pay any regard to the truth and don't care what's true at the end of the day. Um, they're just going to say whatever it takes to get by in life, gain social status, whatever it is. Uh, or sometimes, sometimes also bullshitters just do it because it's fun. They just do it because oh, it's yeah. fun. And like, yeah. they're like, they're, yeah. they just don't care. Yeah. But Stoner. You know, itself Stoner. Is kind of damaging over time. Yeah. 
The dissertation scene in Stoner. I'm telling you, that's like the classic. I've never read, I've never read Stoner, so Oh, it's I, so you good. know, I should It's, read it sometime. it's my favorite. Yeah. It's one of my favorites of all time. I love that book. Uh, but that particular scene is, you'll, you will see what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I got a question here about uh, Wheel, is that from Wheel of Time? Jordan's final finale, Oh, Memory yeah, of Life? yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, I would have to think a lot about it. And, and so I have this rule when I make videos about stuff now. I wasn't always like this on YouTube, but this is this is new that um, if I'm going to like talk about a book, I now have to read it again if I've never read it before. And if I'm going to talk about the finale of Wheel of Time, I probably have to read all of Wheel of Time again. So I could say I might do a video essay or do videos on on that at one point. But you would have to probably like wait two or three years because I have so many videos that are already on my list of things that I want to do. And I already have so much stuff that I want to read. Um, uh, that's, that's like the, the, the amount actually currently is sort of slightly giving me panic attacks when it comes to like the stuff that I'm trying to do in the future. So, um, but So, maybe, maybe, yeah. so I have Because a question I do love about Wheel that. of Time. Wheel of Time is, Wheel of Time is the best fantasy ever written. I, I know you, Joan is like actually the fantasy expert in this room, but Wheel of Time tops them all. by far. So, yeah. Why? I want to know why, because I've never personally heard a compelling reason to read that series. So I've just never been interested. Um, Wheel of Time is like, I, I think it is actually the most fleshed out and sort of vivid world where it has like a sense of history and how actually, without spoiling anything about it, just like how history and myth blend together in interesting ways that you really don't expect for a lot of the series. But once you kind of understand them, make perfect sense. Um, and how actually the different cultures exist kind of on their own and for like their own sake and for like interesting reasons, while also then eventually playing important parts in the story. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's just like so much complexity to it um, that it's great. And I, and I guess I'm also just like, not as sympathetic to the criticisms about uh of Jordan's stuff that often get get raised um I mean I understand it I think like you know I it kind of is a matter of degree here a lot of people will criticize uh Wheel of Time kind of for the gender politics that's implicit in, in Wheel of Time or often explicit in the dialogue I understand those criticisms I just like happen to like rate them a little less severely than like what most people do so like the things that are flaws I don't think are as big of flaws typically but I think it's yeah I it's It's astounding. And then you get to this last book where the last book is essentially a giant battle scene that you've been told is going to happen for 14 books. And the bat one chapter of that battle is longer than Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone in word count. And it never feels bad. You can read it and you just like, it's, it's, it's gripping. It's amazing. It has the best ending of a series I've ever read. Um, it has some of my favorite characters ever um, for reasons that make sense in the world there's an interesting mix of influences it seems like it's going to be a european kind of romance or a renaissance kind of inspired um fantasy but actually like, there's a lot of like east asian influence and it's not like you just picked and chose and like just kind of for fun it like all makes sense uh in, in a way that's just that's just fantastic and this is not like a book that i series that i read as a kid And then like have just continued to love. I read this like a couple of years ago and I was like, well, okay, I've, I've beaten fantasy now. Like fantasy has been defeated. I, I now know what the best is. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you could help me then with this. Uh, and don't be offended if I criticize some aspects of it. I did not. You're allowed to be, you're allowed to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> thank, oh, thank you. Thank you. I often am. <laughs> um, Yeah, so I read Eye of the World. I read the first book and then a little bit of the second book, um, and I stopped there. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think the most common criticism that's probably unfair, given all the people that I've talked to, including Mike, you know, you had Mike on your channel. Um, mm -hmm. I My criticism isn't that it's a Tolkien clone or anything like that. I know it changes and becomes its own thing. And for Jordan, the kind of entryway into getting people to buy his books is the... Uh, so for me, I guess I had a hard time with it because, and just tell me, Jared, why I'm wrong here. Um, yeah. I had a hard time with the fact that I couldn't really tell the characters apart. And it could just be a, 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 a subjective preference on my part. I like books that, wherein the characters, especially the main characters, where there is what A.P. Canavan and Philip Chase, hi guys, like to call internal focalization. Um, so 
I like books where the story is told really and truly deeply from the character's inner subjectivity. Um, and sometimes with Jordan, it feels like you're in an RPG game or something. You're like, you're like looking down at the characters from above and I can never really tell them apart. And I've never feel like I'm enough in the character's heads. Yes. Jordan has beautiful prose. Maybe I haven't gotten in, into the series enough. So tell me if this, maybe this changes, so, but. To, yeah. So two things. One is that you, I really think to understand if you're going to like wheel of time or not, you have to finish the great hunt. So that's the second book. Uh, because I think that's where the series comes into its own. And suddenly you realize you're reading a very different kind of story than you thought. Because actually in the first book, for spoilers for most of the first book, I, I apologize for this, but like you, they kind of all think they're going to like beat the bad guy at the end of the first book. <laughs> Cause like they think they're going to go to the eye of the world and everything's going to be fine. And like, you know that there's 13 other books. So you as a reader know that that's not going to happen. But um, then you, then you read that and you, you, um, you realize that there's just so much more complexity in this. But one of the things that happens a little bit later in the series, but especially in the great hunt, it begins um, is that uh one, like everyone should know, you should know that Rand is the main character by the first chapter because he's the farm boy who gets to like, you know, in the, in the very first chapter, even though they, Jordan kind of makes it a mystery for about four chapters. Um, Rand, you start seeing a lot more of Rand's internal struggle with essentially being like the chosen one and actually really struggling against that in, in, in interesting ways. And then, um, and knowing that he's going to go insane eventually, he's going to go mad. And that's like a big part of it. And that, so his experience actually starts mattering a lot more but also the big thing you the, the three characters i imagine you can't tell apart at first very well are matt perrin and Ram because they're all like friends they're the same age they're 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 all men and they all come from the same village and they're all on the same adventure um and they get split up in the narrative like a lot in fact for the majority of the series they are not talking because they're in different parts of the world in various combinations that helps a lot, actually. They each get to stand on their own. They each get to start forming other um, new relationships. And then they kind of bond with different characters. And then you realize a character who has become so central to, like, Perrin, Rand only knew in passing once. And then they, if they ever reconvene, you're like, whoa, you know, suddenly these two characters don't have a relationship. And that's often how you can really see the difference here is, like, when two characters share a bond and then to then one of that pair shares another bond, but like the, the, the triangle is not complete, right? Um, something like that. So, so I do think that they do get fleshed out and they do kind of become their own thing. And it becomes a little bit less like Rand's a warrior and Matt's a rogue and, and Perrin's like the closer to like a barbarian class or something because he's like big and has a, has a hammer. Um, it, it's like a little bit less like that as, as they go. And they all take on new complexities too, roles that you would not expect them to take on. Wow. Well, that was the best ever reason I've ever heard to, to read The Wheel of Time or the best explanation, honestly, because that's the challenge is that most of like what you were saying about how you read it two years ago, most of the people I know who love Wheel of Time, they grew up with it. It was it's more of an it seems like more of a nostalgia piece for them. And I like what you were asking too, Jordan, about the characters and Jared, you fleshing that out or explaining how that gets a little more fleshed out as you go on. But also when you were talking about it the first time, you didn't really bring up the characters. You were talking about the myth and the way that the story uh, borrows influences. Yeah. And so I think it just speaks to different reasons why we read as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this came up when I was talking with Mike once. Um, I, if you're kind of, kind of like split these all apart as if like they're not totally separable, but if you imagine like, you could imagine like, ideas and like themes as being like one major reason to read world building is like one major reason to read especially if you're into science fiction and fantasy prose is another major characterization plot i am actually much more heavily slanted towards like ideas themes world building and prose than i am towards characterization and plot characters and plot are important to me but like you have to rank them somehow right and they just end up being fairly fairly low i'd rather have good characters than a great plot so plot is probably actually the least important thing when i read um, but I really want to hear, yeah. So I really want to see like interesting ideas explored um, and done in worlds that I think feel interesting as well. And world building can matter in more than just science fiction and fantasy. Even literary fiction has to have an element of world building. You have to feel like Joyce's Dublin actually is Dublin or as it is a world that's similar enough to Dublin or has its own kind of characteristics 
in order for it to not feel like just a set piece in a bad play. Mm, yeah, that's beautifully, beautifully said. I totally agree with you. I It's funny because I was just um, having a conversation with another booktuber yesterday. He posted a video about uh, Gardens of the Moon not being so big on it. That's book one in Malaz and Book of the Fallen and saying that he didn't connect to any of the characters. And he imagines that this is a because this is a 10 book series, it's going to be one of those things where you probably have to be on this journey with the characters before you get attached to them. And I tried to explain, well, yes and no, that's not really the focus of the narrative. I would say it's much more focused on the world and on these bigger questions um, than it is about specific central characters, because there are literally hundreds of POV characters in Malazan, uh, literally hundreds, and he doesn't stop introducing characters even through book 10. So it's not really the focus. And I even heard Erickson in a recent discussion say that he, it, it's okay if you even forget character names. Like that's not really, that's not really what he's going for. Though I do love this characterization personally. Um, but there are different. It's it's kind of the idea I think a lot of people have is like okay, it's epic fantasy, but the idea is I'm following these characters and I'm in a close relationship with these characters. But it's it's different. It takes a different focus. I think Martin with a Song of Ice and Fire. He has a really unique approach to epic fantasy because it is big and sprawling and it is epic and there is so much history to it. It's like hundreds of thousands of years of history and lore and just epic magic and expansion. But at the same time, he somehow manages to have so many POV characters and still make it, I think the experience you're talking about, Jordan, that more internalized vocalization yeah, that, that's probably why George R. R. Martin is my favorite fantasy writer. Um, I don't like so much. And I guess we're all going to have our different rankings. I actually think that it's kind of a, maybe I'll make a video about that. And I find myself wondering what yours are, uh, Joanna. But I guess for me, it's uh, it's probably characterization uh, is is number one. I want a story. Um, I want to and it could be just the fiction that I that I grew to love as I got older, Charles Dickens. And, you know, I like modern writers like Jonathan Franzen and, you know, Richard Russo and, uh, and things like that. I want my story to be told for really from the inside of the character's head. Now, some fantasy authors will do a character will go somewhere. Then you'll, you'll be shown the character thinking about something. Um, and then the character will interact in the world. There'll be some dialogue. And then a little bit later, they'll be thinking about something again. I actually want to have the story told through the lens of the subjectivity of the character. So not the author describing a tree and then the character walking up to it, but the character actually seeing the tree. And, uh, and if the character approaches the tree, they're seeing the tree from their perspective while thinking about their angsts and worries and you know Catelyn thinking worrying about her children and all of the angst and dread that she feels as she's going about doing these things to not have them all chopped up and separate I guess that's just more what I'm used to and what I enjoy yeah yeah it's neat um AP Canavan actually a critical dragon since you mentioned him uh I asked him when at one point if you would do a video and he he uh he did. I asked him to do a video on tone and explaining what tone means in books, because I hear people or at the time I was actually asking people, like, what do you mean when you say tone? And everyone I talked to had a different answer and couldn't quite nail it down. And he explained it in a video and he actually used the prologue of a Malazan book. I think it was book seven, the prologue of that book. And it, and he showed that exact technique, like how the character was thrashing around in the waves and everything is chaotic, but it's more like a reflection. The atmosphere or tone or the setting is more, even though it sounds like it's a horrible setting, a lot of it is the psychology of the character and how that's being um, affected or projected through that experience too. Like it could have been a totally different situation if it were a different character in the same situation. Uh, so I like that technique too. I think that's really cool. But as far as like ranking those things, hard mm -hmm. to do, really hard to do. Yeah. Because I I think I've become, um, over the last few years, I've become someone who's appreciated good prose or become more 
maybe more conscious, I guess, of how prose affects my experience. I'm not saying I'm at the level where I can dissect prose um, on the level of like, let's say, A.B. Canavan, but I, I have become conscious of how that much that affects my experience and how good, how the skill of prose is what affects characterization. It's what affects tone. It's what affects our experience of setting. It's what affects these, obviously the way ideas or even big ideas are conveyed. I think a lot of it is going to be through the prose. And maybe that's why I'm not, I'm not the biggest plot driven reader as Jared, you said earlier, because I just don't, I don't know. That's actually the one area where I think I'm not sure that prose really matters as much, but it's also not something that I put the highest value on in a story. And it kind of depends on the type of story though. You know, some stories, yeah, I am going to be a little bit more plot engaged. Um, it just depends. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm kind of with you, Joanna, because I guess plot is way less important to me. I think it's more important in fantasy than literary fiction, but you know, some of my favorite books are books wherein nothing happens. Right. So I'm thinking of like, um, Richard Ford's uh, Frank Bascom series um, and the one that won uh, the Pulitzer Prize, maybe it was the National Book Award, was the second one. It's called Independence Day. And that is about a realtor in Haddam, New Jersey, who is um, – he's describing that he's living through the existential period of his life. And he's this boring sort of bougie single – um, he's, he's got two kids and he's kind of estranged from them. And the whole book is about, uh, the main character, Frank, taking his son who just got in big trouble for shoplifting. He takes him on a trip to the basketball hall of fame in Springfield and then the baseball hall of fame in Cooperstown, New York. And the whole book is just that it's their car trip. It's his realtor activities, but his inner life is so rich and so complex and, and, and the thoughts that he's having and his inner sort of monologue, um, I could just, I could just read that all day and, um, and nothing's happening really. Yeah. Well, that's how I feel about stoner. I mean, you'll hear us talk, talk about it all the time. Like it's pretty much given away what the book's about or what happens within the first two paragraphs of the book. But there's something about that character that speaks to me on so many levels or what the book is what I think John Williams might be trying to say through this character and through this story. Uh, and it is, you know, it's like kind of historical fiction because it does take place during World War One and World War II in Missouri and a university there. But it's like uh, you were saying earlier, Jared, I mean, there's certainly world building involved. Like you, st you certainly get the feeling of that time and place and changing of season. And I think that's also super important to me. Hmm. That is absolutely true. I am really sorry to do this. I left the chat... I have a very loud and crying baby, and I think my wife needs some help, so I got to drop. I am very, very sorry to cut this short. Oh no! Okay, well, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I'm that sorry. Uh, we didn't get to I talk think longer. Needs a pair of hands, yeah, yeah. But we'll talk. We'll talk another time. I, I promise. But I'm very sorry to, to drop that. But uh, okay, yeah, continue on. This was great. I'll watch the rest of it later. I'm sure you guys will have a lot to say. Uh, take care. This is nice All to right, meet thanks. you. Thanks. Nice to be, nice yeah. to nice to meet you. Thanks. Yeah. Well, actually, he and I met last week um, on Mike's chat, but didn't get to talk with him more in depth. So I love Fantastic. his videos, just get, getting, getting really into his, uh, his videos, just great stuff. Yeah. And I wanted to ask him about journaling because <laughs> he has several videos about that topic, which very much interests me. I like, um, I like how he takes his camera and he shoots his, he, he directs it down and you can see him writing with his hands. And I, I like how he makes his videos. Yeah. I'm going to catch up on the chat here because I feel kind of bad neglecting it, but I just wanted to be really mindful of everything everyone was saying. So yes, I do hear about this slog in the wheel of time, which does make me kind of nervous about that series. It's also just a big undertaking to take on, what is it, a 12 book series, and then expect like a three to four book slog. And of course, it's like, what do people mean by slog specifically? Because some things that people, like you were saying, that when there could be books where quote unquote, not a lot happens. And sometimes those are my favorite kind of books. So who knows? Um, and yes, I, well, <laughs> I, I don't know who you're directing this at, probably all of us, Evie, but I know I will definitely be continuing the Realm of the Elderlings. I just need to carve out time for live ship, but I'm looking forward to it. Have you read Realm of the Elderlings? No, not at all, no. but I'm, that's like a TBR sort of thing. I, 
I just keep hearing it from everyone and everyone I love and respect is now reading Robin Hobb and I feel left out. So I'm going to have to get in on that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed the Farseer trilogy and would recommend that though, from what I understand from life ship on, it takes on a different vibe. So like the Farseer trilogy is in first person narration and we're really mm -hmm. in this character fits his perspective. I really love what she did with it. I thought it was really, really good uh, to the point where I was impressed because I've often been one of those people who are a little biased against first person, like not sure if that's yeah. my favorite type of style, mm -hmm. but I think she did an amazing job, not only making Fitz a very compelling character, the character we're in the mind of, but also fleshing out every character around him to a profound degree. Um, it's excellent. I thought well, it was what do you like about trilogy. Farseer? Uh, why should I read the Farseer trilogy? What What is it that uh, I've been told a couple of things. I've been told that uh, it's a little slow and mm -hmm. I've heard the overused critique, not much happens. Um, maybe that's Maybe that's wrong. Why should I read it? That's a good question. So like I said, it, it's in first person narration. Um, I, I would say if you are somebody, like you said, you want the world or the character's perspective, you definitely get that with our character fits because we follow him from when he's a very young boy. He's in a very complicated situation because his father was to be heir of the kingdom. And um, unfortunately, once Fitz's birth was known about, it kind of shamed his father to exile himself. And then so Fitz is brought into this castle. And then eventually it's a very complicated upbringing where he's try they're trying to deal with the fact that he's this sort of royal bastard in a sense. But at the same time, um, they want to make use of him. So they train him into being an assassin. And you get that perspective in the first book. The second book, Royal Assassin, you see his journey continue and he does go through a lot of really difficult situations. I know that a lot of people will talk about how Robin Hobb is so good at depicting trauma. And she depicts the really challenging character dynamics around Fitz. Some of the, the difficulties he endures. There's a really interesting, there's magic that's maybe not the most unique you've seen in fantasy. So like, for example, you have characters who they're, uh, share thoughts with wolves or bond with wolves kind of similar to warging in a way, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's different for sure. And what, what would I say about the Farseer trilogy and people in the chat, you could all help me out about what to say about the Farseer trilogy. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to highlight some here. Oh, Andy Smith. Hello, Andy. If the Fitz trilogy initially doesn't draw you in. Yeah. I really enjoyed it, but in fall in love, still continue with the live ship traders trilogy. So yeah, a lot of people say that. And that's what I mean. Like the first trilogy is first person. You're really in this intimate experience with the character. I would say you really, I was talking with Derry and Evie about this trilogy at one point. And one theme that really spoke to me in this trilogy was sacrifice. And I don't think she's on the nose about that at all. I think it was something that I didn't really consider until long after I finished the series and then looked back. So I think you would appreciate the way she approaches themes because they're there, they're there. And it's like one of those series where it looks like just, you could just appreciate it on a superficial level, but if you keep thinking about it and digging back the layers, there's so much there and there's so much good writing there too. Uh, and yes, I know I need to continue the series because <laughs> we do return back to this character Fitz. Uh, Farseer is wholly realized though Fitz, through Fitz's eyes, so subjective that as Fitz ages, he begins to realize what's actually happening around him is seen differently than others. So yeah, they, I think you see that around him. Uh, but here's Mike. Hello, Mike. And Mike says here that he thinks that live ship is the best. So he was not hot on this trilogy, just FYI. I know Mike did not like Farseer specifically the third book, Assassin's Quest which is a slow paced book. And even I can say that. And I'm somebody who appreciates slow paced books, but yeah, it's definitely something that you have to be in for a slow burn, at least with that trilogy. Life Ship Traders is multi POV though. So it really opens up quite a bit. Which How one you do you guys? like it's... more? Well, I haven't read Life Ship yet, but oh, I'm right, expecting right, right. I'll probably prefer Life Ship 
Because I do prefer multi POV, even though I think that Robin Hop was a master, like she was a master at doing uh, first person narration, in my opinion. And I did love the character mm -hmm. of Fitz. But the challenge with any sort of first person narration is if you don't attach to that character, if you right. don't attach to Fitz Farseer, you're probably not going to like the trilogy. And I think that's why that trilogy is a little bit divisive. But I think I, I honestly liked it. So I'm expecting to love um, Live Ship more, though, because it sounds even more magical, like more mm -hmm. unusual as far as the magic, like ships that are alive, which I don't know how she pulls off. And then having multi POV. And I think one of the strengths that I've often heard about, I feel like I could talk about Live Ship a little better, even though I haven't read it. But one thing I've heard about Live Ship traders is that she's really, really good at, you know how in life, the way that you talk to your wife is probably going to be different than the way that you talk to your students. They're going to see a different side to you Code switching, or the way yeah. that you talk with your friends. It's going to be a different side to you. Yeah. Apparently Robin Hobb is the master at showing those different ways that we interact with people based on the situation and context in person. That's brilliant. That's what I've been told over and yeah, over I've, again. I'm kind of one of those people that, yeah, sometimes uh, if it's not done well, first person narration where there's only one character can be a little claustrophobic. Um, and I, I do tend to like a more sort of George R. R. Martin sort of expansive world where you get the world through a bunch of different characters. But uh, if it's done well, there's almost no greater pleasure than a than a well written, uh, you know, first person narration. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I thought it was really well done. Just that third book. I, I honestly love the third book because there are parts of the third book that I still think about, especially some conversations that happen towards the end. And I have some very unpopular opinions, as some people in this chat know, about a certain character that everybody loves in Farseer. Uh, <laughs> but I haven't read on yet. So I actually have no right wow. to have a judgment. Live, but live anyway, ship. yeah, it's, live it sounds, sounds like interesting. A, it does Very sound interesting, interesting because I'm that's making me think of like there are many sci fi novels uh, where the sh the spaceships are conscious. Uh, you mm -hmm. have this like sentient artificial intelligence that is able to like it has become aware um, and the ships are kind of alive in different ways. Um, so that kind of I wonder if she's pulling from that tradition in science fiction. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder too. That's a really good question because that's been around in sci-fi for a long time, yeah. right? That's yeah. a very common theme, common idea that's explored. Well, it reminds you of that. Uh, what I forget if it was Arthur C. Clarke or Asimov that said any science sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. Um, yeah, it, isn't it interesting that the only two genres that could really pull that off are sci-fi and fantasy, and they pull it off in different ways, one through magic, one through advanced technology. Kind of cool. Yeah, that is really cool. That's really cool. Um, a question I was going to ask both of you, actually, because I knew that you both have read McCarthy and really enjoyed McCarthy. And I thought this would have been interesting to ask Jared about this as well, because I I had a Why Read episode a while back where I was talking to another couple of McCarthy fans and asked them like what they loved about McCarthy and darker tone books, because they tended to be people who read a lot of darker fantasy and for them, they said, well, it's reality. It's more like how the world is kind of answer. And I thought it was interesting, um, an interesting perspective on why they were interested in more darker tone books and why McCarthy specifically spoke to them. But I was curious to ask you two this question because I see you and Jared as not being quite so cynical about life. <laughs> I mean, I could be wrong, but I get the idea that maybe you have a more hopeful outlook and especially you, because you've told me privately, I guess, off, off live show, off live stream, um, we had a conversation once and you said that you don't believe a true nihilist exists. Yeah. So I, I know that's probably a lot that I'm throwing at you right now, but maybe no, I'll fine. just start with like, what makes you like McCarthy? Well, first of all, uh, to, to your earlier point about, you know, oh, McCarthy's very dark. Why do people like that? Um, yeah. Um, there's a great, Cormac McCarthy quote, he says that if it doesn't concern life and death, it's not interesting. Um, and yeah, I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of there. Um, so for me, I guess it's more like when I read George R. R. Martin and it's, it's pretty dark or when I read R. Scott Baker and it's pretty dark. Um, yeah, I kind of agree with 
the pals that you have that say the world kind of is that way from a certain perspective. Um, if you really think about what this complicated thing that we call life here really is, um, there are aspe aspects of it that are really that can be really dark. We're acknowledging the reality of life. Uh, you know, people who say that you're born alone and you die alone and all that stuff. Um, but I think ultimately I am, as you said, an optimistic person. I, what The reason I really like uh, Cormac McCarthy is, well, first of all, I like Westerns and many of his books are, are Westerns. I also love his rugged, terse, Faulknerian prose. I, I just absolutely... Uh, I think he's he's one of the great uh, American writers. Um, and so let's see, I've read The Road. Um, that is one of the best, you know, post-apocalyptic novels I've ever read. Um, it is just so beautifully written. And some of the risks that Cormac McCarthy is able to take, certainly the way in which his prose doesn't really use grammar or punctuation, um, but somehow he pulls it off. There's a great uh, maxim that Harold Bloom, the literary critic, came up with. Uh, he says that what makes writers great is their idiosyncratic strangeness, uh, a mode of originality that um, that so assimilates us that we cease to see it as strange. McCarthy is one of those writers that you read two sentences. Someone could just pull two sentences out of his book and post it as a tweet, and you know exactly who it is, even if McCarthy's hasn't been named. It's different, and yet, and ordinarily we would, in a creative writing class, we would probably not instruct students to write this way, but it works, and there's a kind of magic to it that assimilates us, uh, as, as Bloom says. So McCarthy's got that quality that I think all great writers have, which is that idiosyncratic strangeness uh this mm -hmm. this this way of um doing things differently and speaking in their own voice and kind of crafting that and cultivating that let's see i've read all the pretty horses which you know won a national book award and i think is probably his most underrated book i think that book is so magical and is so kind of um it's uh it's a unique one for mccarthy because you know, it's sort of like one last cowboy adventure. The characters are young. There's romance. There's shootouts. There's, um, you know, there's there are violent prison scenes, but there are also horse chases and sort of a romantic adventure. Um, another thing that is important about McCarthy is that I don't think anyone has a richer or more expansive vocabulary or a more evocative power at describing the natural world. Uh, using language, um, uh, you know, other writers could digress for three pages uh, about the environment. Cormac McCarthy spins off two sentences to give you a sense of what this, you know, uh, this prairie land looks like or this vista looks like as a storm is 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 coming on. Uh, he's just such a an evocative, beautiful writer, um, and, and again, he's able to do things in so few words. Uh, but in but in such a way that he doesn't really need very many words. Uh, let's see. I, I read uh, Blood Meridian as well. Um, uh, I don't agree with Harold Bloom that that's even McCarthy's best work, uh, or that it's up there with um, you know Melville or you know Twain's Huckleberry Finn as being like one of the great works of American literature. But I think it is stark and beautiful and gripping and almost difficult to read at times, but also just, it's one of those books you have to close the book and just, and just kind of, you know, maybe take a, take an hour to think about what you just read and then, and then you can come back to it. Uh, anyways, I'm, I'm rambling. Uh, I love Cormac McCarthy. I, I could, I could go on all day about it. That's the problem. So, and rest in peace because he just recently passed away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, with uh, Blood Meridian, that was my introduction. No, actually, it wasn't. I read No Country for Old Men, about 10, 11, no, longer than that, probably like 12, 13 years ago now. And at the time, I was not impressed. I, I thought it was okay, and I thought it was interesting. I remember thinking, oh, that was interesting the way he told this story, because he went in a direction I was not expecting. Um, so I appreciated the unique structure to that story. But I was expecting, 
I don't know what I was expecting, but I know that um, I had heard so many, so many people gush about the movie at the time. And I just, I don't know what I was expecting, but I was expecting something more than what I felt. And it was okay. But then I, I got to uh, Blood Meridian, thanks to Jimmy last year. And we read it together about like three pages. I don't know. It was not three pages a day, like what, five to 10 pages a day, maybe 10 pages a day. I can't remember now. And that was probably the best way to consume that kind of book because there's a lot to unpack. It's like, it's very, very dense. It's very, very dense and it is very dark, but at the same time, I thought it was the most atmospheric book I've ever read. I mean, really, truly, I, I could mm -hmm. not believe the way that he described the desert. Every time I, I read the way that McCarthy describes the desert, I feel like I'm there, but he gets it. He gets it because a lot of people, they think of the desert and they just think, oh, it's just dirt and some tumbleweeds. And even if you hear about, like, if, even if you read about the desert in certain books, sometimes I feel like the authors just lack for description, mm -hmm. but he never lacks for description. He mm -hmm. has like a thousand ways to describe the desert in his books. It's yes. just ever changing. And there's always a there's always like a forward motion and momentum and behind the storytelling. It just yeah. keeps you propelled. And, but I, I really appreciated that because the parts of the world that he writes about, especially that. And of course, um, all the pretty horses, by the way, I read this year, thanks to you, you're the one who recommended that to me. So thank you very much. Well, thanks for reading. And, I'm happy you did that. And it is one what of my favorite think? books. Did you of, like it? It's one of my favorite books of the year. And by the way, uh, I think, Let's see. I have not read The Road yet. And Mike, I think that um, All the Pretty Horses will be a home run for you, honestly. <laughs> I love that. that book. I've yeah. told him that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I totally agree with your your point exactly. Um, another thing that McCarthy's good at doing, and if even if you don't like Westerns, I think you could appreciate this, is that McCarthy is doing something different than traditional Westerns. They call this in, in the film genre, anti-Westerns. Yeah. Westerns have traditionally been very masculine persons of integrity mm -hmm. and principle, a good man with a gun, right? And they're usually lawmen and uh, ranchers and army officers and, and cowboys. And they're, you know, they've got that quick draw They're They've got these heroic qualities uh, and they're kind of standing alone and facing danger uh, on their own, right? Uh, no one in the town will deal with these outlaws, but here comes the hero. Um, I wouldn't say, I don't like the word like problematize. I don't think McCarthy problematizes that, but he turns it on his head on its head, this, these tropes in a way that is generative and not reactionary. Um, and the way but that's a good which, point. That's a really good point, by the way, I, I want to yes. hold on to that point. Um, go ahead. Sorry. I have yeah, some thoughts yeah. on that. Um, and one of the things I've always liked about Westerns in general, and I think McCarthy is better at almost, but then almost anyone at doing this is, uh, to use an enlightenment term, uh, Westerns reduce the world and and uh, simplifies the world. Westerns give you these moral dramas that that where you strip everything away and you put people in this almost primeval desert setting and you strip everything down and you reduce human beings to a state of nature. And there are typically fewer characters in Westerns. Everything's kind of spread out. I think this is one of the reasons that people like uh, are starting to get into these kind of Western uh, fantasies. When you watch a Western, there, there is Westerns always have a tenuous hold on the rule of law and has a more fluid uh, uh, social fabric. It, Westerns lack that confining web of conventions and mundane safeties that typify more settled societies, and they strip everything down to this to the bare necessities and you get to, to watch human dramas play out on this very uh pared down stripped down uh setting and so westerns are often about human nature and i don't think anyone does that better than cormac mccarthy i'm telling you oh i love everything you just said i totally agree with you well, and it's beautiful what you said about it being regenerative rather is that regenerative generative rather, rather than reactionary gen yeah generative rather than reactionary i love that because i totally agree with you i don't think that see this is the thing that i love about mccarthy's books and especially blood well actually both 
Blood Meridian and No Country for Old Men and The Crossing, which I also read. I need to continue on with the with that trilogy. How was it? I but haven't read The Crossing yet. I, oh, yes. I love it. Um, so I would say The Crossing is an interesting balance between, between uh, All the Pretty Horses and Blood Meridian because it's a bit more dense. I think that All the Pretty Horses is just a much more fluid story. It's, I don't know. I feel like I wouldn't have to read that as slowly though I did <laughs> I took my time with that too um when I was buddy reading that with Jimmy but with the crossing I thought that one that one did have some moments where I really had to unpack and there are some really dark things that happened in that book I bet. it's an intense book and then on the one hand it almost seems seems very straightforward as far as what's happening in the story and then you get to the end and you're like what wow <laughs> it's intense and he does he does seem to enjoy similar themes i've noticed in all his books like he tends to really enjoy exploring this idea that you know that god left you i guess i know that a lot of people talk about nietzsche when they talk about mccarthy i imagine mm -hmm. but then there's also the the relationship between father and son the father and son relationship is always there but it's a powerful story i think i might it's hard for me i don't even know if i could choose Totally, but I might have preferred all the pretty horses. I might have preferred all the pretty horses. It's really hard well, to that tell. That says something about the two of us because that is, I think, what you said about me being more optimistic. I think that is true. You know, even though I like dark books, um, there's something there's something about me that I want. Um, Cormac, uh, all the pretty horses is my favorite Cormac McCarthy novel, um, and um, yeah, it's just. Again, what's interesting about McCarthy is, as I said earlier, that I like internal focalization, and there really isn't very much in that. You're really kind of outside of the characters' heads in a weird way. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a ton of sort of deep, uh, meandering reflections on the part of the characters. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. It's the characters doing things and saying things uh, in this, as we said, beautiful uh, desert landscape and things like that. But um, and isn't it funny that uh, in the road, it, the road is kind of like a western too. I haven't it's read a, it. Oh, oh, okay. I won't say anything. I haven't read the road okay. yet. Okay. I know that sounds crazy as somebody who's becoming a McCarthy fan who who has not read the road. But honestly, the only reason I haven't read the road is because I know, like Liam, for example, he's talking about how he prefer he prefers his westerns with swords <laughs> and eldritch aspects. Yeah. So for me, I I'll be honest. I know it sounds crazy. But post-apocalyptic settings are just not my buzzword. Like, I never feel compelled to read a book when I hear that. But I've been wrong before many times, yeah. and I'm sure I will love it. But, yeah, I have not read it yet. Um, but, yep. I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Nothing. Nope. Yeah, I was just going to say, though, I really love this idea of it being generative because – the other thing that I really love about what I've read of McCarthy so far is that he really honors the culture and the history and the land in the most authentic way possible, mm -hmm. because I'm from that part of the world. I grew up in the Southwest and not only that, but he does, a, you know, of course, with the crossing, um, especially with the crossing and all the pretty horses, the characters go into Mexico, into Northern Mexico. My family's from Northern Mexico. His characters in the crossing end up in the same town that my grandfather was mayor. There's a street wow. named after my grandfather in one of the towns where the characters end up. Wow. And it's a tiny, tiny, tiny town. So when I was reading it, I got so excited. And he actually mentions places like I know very intimately, like settings. And I said, oh my gosh, I've been there. And I know that. And I know that. And I know that. And I actually ended up um, telling my dad, because my dad grew up in Mexico and you know, it was his father. And I said, he mentioned the cemetery in this town. He's like, oh yeah, I remember that cemetery. And he wow. knew, I mean, it's, it's so close to me, but I feel as though McCarthy understood and the way he inserts Spanish here and there mm -hmm. in the dialogue, everything about it felt so intimate for me personally that I felt like he honored it though. I felt like he really honored it. So it, you know, like you were saying, it's not reactionary in that way. Like he there's a lot of, of um, there was a lot that he put it of himself into that book mm -hmm. uh, that he put it. There's a lot of himself and a lot of work and a lot of care that he puts in his, into his storytelling. 
And to me, it's so obvious. And I know a lot of people might discard him because the lack of punctuation and the way he writes, but there is purpose behind every sentence, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and Evie asked about this earlier. She said that as someone who has struggled with McCarthy's prose, particularly the run on sentences, do you have any advice for how better to better approach his style? Do you have advice for her? Uh, do I have advice? Um, maybe <clears throat> this is not going to, this is not going to be very English teachery or philosophy teachery advice. So this is going to sound like very subjective, hazy, vague advice, but I suppose um, to, huh, to really feel it rather than read it. Um, when you are That's reading perfect. McCarthy, think about the, the, cho the, uh, the choices he's making and the way in which the way in which he writes his sentences, how that is supposed to be evocative of tone and mood and atmosphere and see if you can just feel it rather than intellectually grapple with it. Just let, just give yourself over uh, to the master and uh, let's see if, if he's able to, to weave a spell uh, that works on you. If you kind of approach it in a different way, see if you can feel it, the way in which the language evokes um, that part of Mexico or in the road uh, when everything is raining ash and everything again is stripped down and there's no food and it's just a father and a son. Um, see if you can really feel that dialogue and the way in which the music of it and the, the rhythm of it is meant to actually is almost like a character in the story. People often say the setting is like a character in this story. Uh, the language is almost like a character in McCarthy's story. So see if you can do that. I know that's very hard to do. You can't, you just have to, I, I don't know if I can communicate that with you and have you just do it. You might have to just figure it out on your own. Oh, I think that's perfect advice. And that's exactly the experience, in my opinion. Like that's that's why I it got under my skin because I feel like the way that he, the exact word choice would just evoke that sensory experience with the words. It's more than just a visual experience too with McCarthy's prose. It's actually like a, a visceral experience. Like it's a, it has a way of getting under your skin. Yes. Um, and Liam said eldritch. Yes. He, there's something deeply eldritch and ancient. He has an old soul. There's this almost um, biblical feel to uh, a mm -hmm. lot of his prose. Uh, the, you know, the road is a post-apocalyptic novel, but I think McCarthy's spirit, his spirit is post-apocalyptic. The, he doesn't just describe, <clears throat> you know, um, lightning striking. It's lightning like, you know, lighting up a forge in the deep darks of the world, the, of the iron dark of the world or something like that. Everything is just so dramatic without being melodramatic, uh, even his descriptions of nature. And there's just something very sort of real and almost kind of ancient and biblical about his, his work. It's like you're getting a portal uh, into, uh, you know, a different age or something like that. Oh, I love that. That's so beautifully said. That's exactly how I feel. And that's also something that I, that I associate with the desert as well, is there is that, there's like this old energy there. Like it's almost, it's interesting because when I lived in the desert, I could feel the superstition in the air. You know what I mean? Like it would be much easier or it's much easier to almost imagine being superstitious in that setting. Yeah. And it is where I live now. Like it, there's something about that, that primordial feel to his right. prose. Right. It's powerful. I, I And another, um, some other advice I've heard, and I did take this advice, though I did kind of go back and forth between what I'm going to say. So I had heard advice on YouTube already from some other kind of booktubers, I think more in the classical sphere, that said that they would recommend listening to the audiobooks and maybe immersion reading it. Be, or if you're struggling and you don't want to listen to the audiobook, maybe just read some passages out loud because it is kind of like poetry in a way. Um, and totally. sometimes the oral tradition of just speaking it out loud will help you. And I think that it is, I think that also helps because like you said, it is so rhythmic that speaking prose out loud, I think can help you when, when it tends towards being more rhythmic. And so I kind of did both. I immersion read the McCarthy that I've read so far. But I've also gone back with some of it. I would pause the audiobook and then reread just visually with my eyes, or I would kind of do a combination of those two things. But that could be helpful, just maybe for some people.
Totally. I also love, really love your point that you make about the way in which setting is so important to what you end up believing. The idea that it's e easier to be superstitious in this place than it is in, I'm just picturing like the suburbs or like New York City. Um, not a lot of superstition in like cyberpunk novels, right? So um, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I'm a settings person, especially this last year. That's something I've noticed about my reading. And I don't know if it's always been the case or if I've just become more conscious of it or I'm hy hyper focusing on it lately, but I've noticed setting is so important to me as a reader. Like I just have a very difficult time finding myself immersed in a story if I'm not immersed in the setting. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. But also I just want to bring up too, since you brought up Westerns, have you ever read, <laughs> same author as Stoner, have you ever read Butcher's Crossing? No, I haven't. And the whole John Williams thing with with you and Jimmy, I'm feeling totally left out again because that is <laughs> perfectly in my alleys, in my wheelhouse. Oh, so that would be, yes. that's going to have to be a book that I read like this year, this fall, um, because everything that you've told me about it, uh, what what's the one with the, um, what's the one with the Roman Empire that Williams does, Augustus or something Augustus, like that? Augustus, yeah. Okay, Augustus. Amazing book as well, yes. So, I probably will start with Stoner and Augustus, but tell me, what is this Butcher's Crossing? Butcher's Crossing, it's his Western. And unfortunately, it it received very critical, it received critical reviews when it was first published. But nowadays, people consider it just as much a masterpiece as the other two. Um, Stoner is still my favorite of the three, but I love all three. And I think all three just show his range as an author because he did, he wrote such an incredible Western story in, in Butcher's Crossing. And mm. with that particular story too, I mean, you really, ah, oh man, it's, it's also actually, I think it would be described as a revisionist uh, Western novel yeah. because he, or a reactionary one, sorry, a reactionary way of looking at, at Western novels. Yeah, he was definitely reacting to the to the romanticiza romanticization of Westerns at the time, mm -hmm. like the kind of movies that were playing on display at the time, the romantic mm -hmm. idealism of the Western genre. Oh, it's definitely a reactionary piece to that, mm -hmm. for sure. But I think yeah. you would love it. I am actually pretty certain you would love it. I love the tradition of, you know, revisionist Westerns, anti-Westerns. I I love those. So I'm a big Western fan, whether it is the old school, very simple morality, good guys versus bad guys, and the very similar way in which I love old fantasy, uh, you know, Tolkien and David Eddings. Uh, and, but I also like George R. R. Martin, where, you know, uh, everything is morally gray characters and um and and the grittiness and things like that so and one of my favorite western films is unforgiven with clint eastwood which is like the ultimate uh, anti-western so um gosh it sounds like just john williams is someone that it's like a hole in my literary education so you've got to read john williams okay. and none of the books are very long so that's kind of a fortunate thing right but and none of them are fantasy, but they are all favorites of mine, like Augustus, Stoner. I would definitely go in that order, too. That's the order I read them in anyway. Okay, I'm in. For what it's worth, I read them in Stoner, then Augustus, and then Butcher's Crossing. Stoner is still my personal favorite. I think that Augustus won the book award the year it was published. Mm -hmm. And it's a pistol. And it's totally different because it's an epistolary novel. Mm -hmm. And it's told in not just two letter exchanges back and forth. It's like a series of letters painting the picture of Augustus through letters. Actually, I highly recommend, I'll send you the video sometime, but Sean from Traveling Through Stories, um, he did a remarkable video. You would love his channel for one, but he did oh, yeah. a remarkable video on those three books and a, okay. an amazing analysis of the three books. He's a big fan. He's actually the first channel I ever heard of Stoner from. And then later on, I heard Jimmy talk about it with Alan on Chatting with Nuts. And I picked up the audiobook actually of Stoner and I listened to it on audio. It's very easy to consume via audio because it's not fantasy. <laughs> I it. find fantasy hard via audio, but it's just, they're all three are brilliant. All three are absolutely brilliant. Mm, yeah, um, I agree with you. Fantasy can be hard on audiobook because there's so much world building and there's so much to miss. If you miss one little detail, you're you might be missing something really important about the world and stuff like that. So that's what I'll do, Joanna. I'm going to, 
I'm going to start with Augustus and I'll listen to that on the way to work. And so I might start that in a couple of weeks then. Um, yeah, I just have to do it at this point. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it, it begins with Rose Walden. I think a quote from that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Evie, if I've got the wrong quote in mind, but I'm pretty sure it begins with a quote from that. I, I really think you're going to love all three. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on all three, okay. honestly. Awesome. Um, and then what was I going to say? Oh, hello. Yay. There are a lot of fans here. And let's see. Excited that people are excited about this author because I don't know. I don't know what it is about those books, about his writing. It just, it's so powerful. It's so profound. And by the way, uh, I was excited because to talk with you too, because I actually, like I said, I got into philosophy for a short while when I was younger not nothing heavy. I'm not well versed in philosophy by any means. But I used to meet with a small group when I was in college for fun. We did it for fun with a professor friend of mine. He actually asked me, he said, Do you want to get together and have talks about aesthetics? That's awesome. So this was actually the book that we read together, Aesthetics. It's uh from classical Greece to the present, a short history, though I have not read the whole thing. I've read a lot of it. And just, you know, in various chapters, but not straight through from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely a, uh, a topic I'm passionate about or I'm interested in. And I think it's cool that we're talking about Westerns. We're talking about fantasy and literary fiction. Because I think that's the beauty, I think, to me, of the aesthetic experience is that there are so many different kinds, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, absolutely. I never really studied aesthetics um, formally in college, it's kind of gone by the wayside as a, uh, as a kind of hip, uh, thing to study in college. Um, you'll see, I think that it'll be typically more art history majors and, uh, people who major in art and are interested in art criticism and things like that. Uh, and certainly my approach to aesthetics is super passe. Um, my views on that matter would not make me, would not endear me, uh, to the, you know, current crop of students or even professors. Um, so my views kind of, it's an old one, but it's kind of fallen out of fashion. But, um, I, I just think it's, I, and I, I think I didn't take any aesthetics courses in college, but I started caring about aesthetics. Um, when I started reading like Harold Bloom, uh, after mm -hmm. college, the literary critic, Harold Bloom. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the things that actually made me st start speaking into a microphone. Um, I read his book, The Western Canon. And the reason that that book was super controversial at mm -hmm. the time and still is, is because what he essentially does is he says, there is a canon, there is a Western canon for Westerners. Uh, there, there are a set of books that an educated, refined, erudite person should read. Um, and I'm going to give you the list of books. And at the end of the Western canon, he has this gigantic list. And it's totally multicultural. It's from Spain and uh, Mexico and Russia. And it's, it's books from everywhere. But he actually makes a list of things that everyone should read. And he divides it into you know, um, the, the metaphysicians, the, the realists, the postmodernists, the, and he's got this great list and he goes through the book and just, you know, rhapsodizes, waxes poetically and brilliantly about each, each book or most of the books on his list and, um, how he views, uh, Shakespeare as, uh, the, the centrality of Shakespeare to the Western canon and all of this stuff. So, uh, I was reading that book and I just thought, oh, this is so like provocative and fascinating. So I started like reading about like aesthetics through him. So reading some of his books and then reading articles and watching videos and stuff like that. So I am very like unschooled, untutored when it comes to aesthetics, but I just think it's so fascinating and important and I'm glad you care about it too. Yeah, though, it's just fun. I just think it's fun. It's interesting. Uh, yeah, it's something that's I, been I fascinating like, to me for a I, while. I like having conversations with people who care about aesthetics because I think it's one of the most, um, it's one of the easiest ways to discuss books um, in a way that feels useful. Like when you start talking, Joanna, about the aesthetics of Cormac McCarthy, I can go in there and reread all the pretty horses and look for the stuff you were talking about versus speaking about literature in a much more 
uh, detached, kind of airy, speculative way. I really like focusing. This is just my preference. I like focusing on the formal features and elements uh, in works. And I like teaching that way too. Close yeah. reading. Yeah. Um, oh, speaking of, I was about to talk about you, Philip. <laughs> hey, Philip. Um, and it's totally fine. Just appreciate you stopping by. So thank you so much for your support. Um, and Edie also wants to say that you should read The Vanished Bird. Yes, it's very that? good. It's very good. It's a sci-fi sci opera, um, space opera, sorry. And how do I describe The Vanished Bird? Eve, Evie, give your pitch for The Vanished Bird birds and I will put it in the chat and then talk about it based on what you said because it's been a while but I wanted to go ahead and share really quickly though based on the point that we're talking about with aesthetics is that it was kind of this might sound kind of lofty I don't know but when Philip was giving his top 10 fantasy books um, he was talking about like the the difference between how Tolkien baptized his imagination and Malazan set it free and I got so excited when he said that because I remembered that in this book, there's actually a section from Kant's, uh, for the German idealism chapter, where Kant talks about the different experiences from Kant's perspective, of course, of the sublime and the beauty and the sublime. I don't know if you're familiar with those concepts, but he says- I'm familiar that, with the concepts, but not Kant's view specifically on it. Although I, I know a lot about Kant, but I don't know a lot about Kant's aesthetics. Uh, I'll just read this one sentence here. Awesome. He says, but beauty and sublime are contrasted. And of course, starting in the middle of the paragraph here, it talks about the transcendental exposition of the sublime. Okay. So he says here, but beauty and sublime, sublimity are contrasted in two respects that the former, so that's beauty, is connected with the form, hence the boundedness of an object, while the latter, the sublimity factor, involves an experience of boundlessness mm -hmm. and that the former depends on the purposiveness of an object, making it seem as it were pre-adapted to our judgment while the latter is aroused by objects that seem as it were to do violence to the imagination. And I thought that was kind of perfect. So I guess I'm paraphrasing here what Kant says, but the idea here about beauty being bound and the way that I remember when we had this talk with my professor on this particular chapter he was saying perhaps like a comparison could be if you look at a beautiful flower, you can feel the sense of beauty because you're seeing how there's a symmetry there. You see how all the petals fit together. It's organized in such a way, maybe not perfectly, perfectly symmetrical. Obviously, there's going to be some organic structure in nature, but we understand it. There's something that about us that understands that flower and hence we find it beautiful. Mm -hmm. But with the sublime it sort of blasts us open. So it's like looking at the night, looking at the stars in the sky. If you actually are at a place where you can actually see stars, which <laughs> most of us can't these days because yeah, of light yeah. pollution. But if you've ever had that experience, which I have, there are so many stars, you just can't take it all in. You can't take it yeah. all in. Or looking out at the ocean and just trying to comprehend how vast it is or how big it is. It's just, it almost feels like overwhelming. So when he said that, quote in his uh, top 10 uh, video about how how for him uh, Tolkien baptized his imagination and Malazan set it free my mind went to ah oh, Tolkien was like the beautiful the experience of the beauty of beauty according to Kant of course and maybe uh, Malazan was like the sublime according to Kant just that blasting open <laughs> I think everything. that's probably I love that analogy. I think you're you're engaging in truly original thought here. I don't think anyone has had that thought before, Joanna. I certainly <laughs> haven't. Um, I, 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 uh, I love that idea. And I, I actually mostly agree with Kant there. I, I think he's like spot on. Um, I think the point that he's making is that when we apprehend an aesthetic, when we apprehend an object uh, aesthetically, and hold it up to scrutiny, our interpretation is necessarily going to be bounded because that aesthetic object has certain formal features. Um, Malazan, Book of the Fallen, let's just use that. I ha I've only read the first book, is written in a certain way. It has certain aesthetic features. Those are non-negotiable. He puts, he publishes that book 
and here's the aesthetic object for us to scrutinize. And we only have to work with what we have to work with. Um, but then our inner subjectivity, there's no telling what our like collision with or our interaction with that work, what sorts of, um, you know, feelings, what qualia, what, what that's going to evoke. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's definitely like a subjective sublimity, but also we're working with uh, formal elements, uh, aesthetic features in the object that are bounded necessarily. Uh, when we're, I sometimes have students that are a little confused about this and, you know, we'll be reading Shakespeare and every once in a while, a student will get, will get it wrong. And occasionally a student, a very smart, intelligent, witty student will say, um, We'll say, but this is literature. I thought that nothing was wrong in literature. <laughs> and my point is that no, it's bounded. If you say that Shakespeare's uh, sonnet 116 is about uh, the fact that the moon is made of cheese, you would be wrong, flatly wrong, because that proposition is not borne out by evidence in that poem. It's, it doesn't mention the moon is made of cheese at all. It doesn't talk about cheese. It doesn't talk about the moon. Um, and that is a an incorrect, frivolous interpretation that's not based on the thing we're actually looking at or studying. But so, but it is interpretive, and there are a range of interpretations. And I'm always astonished by how original and thoughtful other people's interpretations are. But it is bounded, right? Um, you know, you have to work with what you have to work with. So, I, re I really like that quote, and I like how you applied that to Malazan and Tolkien. Um, yeah. and you're right. Tolkien is very archetypal. Um, he's, he's, he's working with in a tradition that has, you know, very deep roots. Um, and, uh, so it's interesting. I like, um, you know, I, I like, you feel somehow when you're reading Tolkien that you're somehow closer to this world of heroes and gods and titans and witches, this world of powers and magic and, and passions and things like that. So it feels like S Tolkien and folks like C.S. Lewis and T.H. White are drawing from these legends and traditions and this very old source material. Um, Lloyd Alexander actually calls this the cauldron of story. Uh, Tolkien called it the pot of soup. Um, but, um, and so, and then I think that one of the virtues of reading someone like uh, someone like Steven Erickson or someone like George R. R. Martin is for them, their roots are Tolkien and C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis. And we each have different roots and that keeps getting updated and modified. And anyways, I'm, again, I'm always rambling. Even if it's on. not on a conscious level, I'm getting called out about my pronunciation. <laughs> well, I can't believe you made that point, <laughs> AP. Oops. So funny. Um, yeah, well, I do mispronounce everything, so. Hey, at least you didn't say can't. I don't about. think you said can't. You said can't, right? That's correct. Yeah, but I... <laughs> there's another word that it could have sounded like, I think, is the oh, idea oh, there. Oh, 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 maybe. Uh -oh. <laughs> so hopefully I didn't do that. Um, oh, here we go. The Vanish Birds is lyrical prose with a weaving of narrative plot, 12 chapters that are each essentially their own arc. The sublime ending. That's beautifully put, Evie. I did enjoy it quite a bit. I think that one of the most unique things about that book is you open it up and you start it and you think it's about one kind of story and then it's totally about something else. It, but it, the way it unfolds is done in such a seamless way. It's so beautifully told. It's got some beautiful character work in it. Um, I'm trying to remember more things I could say about it. There is music in it. And I know that's why Evie thought of me. But I did enjoy it. I thought it was a really strong standalone. I really enjoyed uh, Jimenez's prose. I have often described it as like a really good balance between what I would consider more modern prose, but still being lyrical and poetic at the same time. And I think that's a very hard balance to strike these days. You know, where people, when I say modern, I think I'm associating that a little bit with more, more minimal prose, you know, not so like the sentences aren't terribly long. Um, so not overly descriptive, but there's still beautiful descript description in the story as well. Who's the author? Jimenez. It's either going to be um, Simon Jimenez. I don't know if he goes by Simon Jimenez or Simon, Simon. Jimenez, yeah. depending on 
how he identifies his ethnicity and ethnic background or whatever, but he met us. <laughs> Eight, that's a J.I. Okay. I have it on my shelf. I can it for a minute, but... but yes, um, Evie is often promoting his books here on the channel or on her channel. And, uh, I'm glad that I got to that book. I need to read his other standalone. Are you a death of the author? Well, what do we mean by that? Because I know AP is in the chat and has a lot of thoughts on that. Saying yeah, how it's I don't have as many thoughts about that. Um, yeah, especially because I just am not as into uh, postmodern philosophy as a lot of other people who have a lot to say about death of the author. If we're meaning it like semantically, like like when I read books, do I try to think of the author or does what the author does in their personal life matter to me? Um, not necessarily, but I'm a but I do think historical context matters. Um, so I, so it's not for me, it's not just all formal elements. Like I'm not a pure formalist. I do think the way in which we react to literature has to do with th things that are outside of just the formal elements of the work of literature. Um, and historical context is, is, is definitely one of them. Uh, so a work of literature could be the most beautiful thing that you've ever read in your entire life. And yet if it is, um, if it's set in, I don't know if it's set in France during the French Revolution and you don't get that what actually happened during that period right um it's that has to be weighed against how beautiful the prose is and things like that and so I think that even could there's a question of what was the author trying to do as well and uh, you know one of John Updike's famous uh rules of literary criticism is don't accuse the author of doing something that he or she was uh, wasn't trying to do in the first place. So it's that it's not good to approach it that way. So I think maybe, uh, intent, intent matters, just like it matters in morality. It, it, it matters to some degree in it, uh, with aesthetics, um, as well. We'll read things differently no, given what we thought the author was intending or, or whatever. So, um, that's a really good question though. Yeah. I know I got into a kind of discussion with a friend of mine on my channel one time because I said, like I made the claim that I understood the book this way, but it's possible I was misreading it or misunderstanding it. And my friend was telling me, he said, it's your interpretation. You can't be wrong, you know? And I said, well, yeah, I can. <laughs> I think you could definitely be wrong, like, or be, and I've been wrong before. Like there've been times when I've read books or read a scene and I understood it one way. And people said, actually, what was really going on there was this and this, I'm like, oh, Yes, I you're get missing it now. One crucial detail, I, yeah. I, okay, I because I do. I read things kind of. I feel like it's the way my brain works too, which is kind of I think a strength, because in one way I feel like I see things in a unique way and maybe can add yeah. a unique perspective to the discussion. On the other hand, it gets me in trouble sometimes because sometimes I misunderstand something or, yeah, it doesn't quite line up in the same way until somebody explains it or points it out, and then I get it. Yeah, I think there's definitely a bounded range of interesting interpretations. And when I say bounded, they're like almost endless. My goodness. You read Shakespeare's Macbeth, there's a way in which you can read that as, you know, uh, a work of existentialism, right? And um, there's a, another way that you can approach it in a totally different way. So I think, I think, yeah, there are some wrong interpretations. Um, at a certain point, it is kind of bounded. If you're seeing something that's not actually there in the text, um, then you're not even working with the same text that I'm working with. So we kind of have to square square that. But, um, but, but just in the general sense, and I'm sure AP probably has way more sophisticated thoughts on this. He's the literary criticism guy. He, um, he does have videos on this topic. <laughs> I, I'm yeah. going to go watch them when we're done here. Um, but in the sense of like, um, do I think about the author a lot when I'm reading a, a book? Um, am I able to read someone like Lovecraft, who's a bad person and really appreciate his works? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm just, uh, not one of those censor type people that wants to, um, you know, just cancel books from out of history. Um, uh, I'm an adult. I, I understand who Lovecraft was and I can read his, his books without being infected by his odd worldview. Uh, but yeah. uh, if, if that's what you mean, um, yeah, not really. Um, I, I'm not really thinking about the author too much, I guess. I guess I'm not either, honestly. And I know like, for example, I'm reading, um, rereading a song of ice and fire. And I know 
George R. R. Martin has got a lot of criticism for various things that he does. I don't really see it. I don't know. I, I make a separation, I think, when I'm reading the book. And I don't necessarily think, well, because he put this in the book, that means he likes this or wants that, that there's a difference, you know, like, right. and I also think he's really good, in my opinion, of making it clear that it's through the author, through the character's perspective, like what mm -hmm. you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, for me, it's just very clear. For example, like, right now I'm reading some Tyrion stuff. It's pretty unpleasant because Tyrion <laughs> is not in a good place right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He needs some help. He needs some help. But yeah. yeah, and you know, people too are can be, uh, and I respect people's, you know, people's views, but people can be overly selective sometimes with what they get outraged about. So if if something is the issue of the day, then people will get outraged about that. You don't see people out in the streets with placards protesting Martin's books because there's murder in it. And there's no one calling to end the inclusion of murder, which is the worst crime you can possibly imagine from fiction. Everyone's okay with there being murder in fiction, but there are certain other things that get included that are way better, not better, but way less terrible than murder. Those things are not okay in fantasy. So I think we are sometimes uh, a little knee jerk about some of these mm -hmm. things. And I would, I would like to see more, I suppose a more charitable uh, interpretation or approach to these sorts of things. More I certainly feel that way, especially with adult fantasy, because I'm like, we're adults. I mean, I think the intended audience are adults. So right, <laughs> I right. mean, I think that I could trust myself to understand those yeah. nuances yes, and not exactly. need so much like virtue, virtue signaling right. as if it were a YA book, for example, right. where I could see a case for that. I could see a case for that maybe. Mm. Yeah. Um, well said. And Philip wants to know about the undead authors, <laughs> zombie authors. I don't know if I know any of those, unless you're one in disguise, Philip. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Love it. Yes, I do. I need to read that book. That's the other book by the same author as The Vanished Birds. I'm telling you, Evie loves this author so much. And Evie has really good taste in books. So I know I will love it, Evie. I will get to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I did put it on kind of a TBR of sorts. So I will be getting to it. Just, uh, it'll be a little while. Sorry. What are you reading <laughs> right now, Joanna? I'm taking a long time to reread A Dance with Dragons. I feel like I've actually been reading that book for a long time. So it's taking me a while. Um, I know the and feeling. I'm really enjoying it. I'm really, really, I love, I love all five books so much. I think A Song of Ice and Fire is a, is a masterpiece. Uh, I was talking about this with uh, with Jimmy actually recently because I I I I've been curious about like subgenres lately, like the labeling of subgenres because I think that could be helpful for some things, especially mm -hmm. for being able to explain what a book falls into, like to give the proper expectation for a book. And I know a lot of people call A Song of Ice and Fire grimdark, and I understand that they might mean more than just what they say with that word. But for me, I feel like it's almost a, re a little reductive to call it grimdark because there are so many things in that series. Like there's so much heart in that series for one thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that can sometimes get overlooked. And I know a lot of people are probably just thinking about the show. And to me, the show and the books are such different experiences. And so I don't know. So I'm rereading that. Sorry, long story about that. But I'm really loving that experience, loving the world building, loving the character work. It's so magical. That's the other thing too. It's so, so magical in book five. Magic is full on display in that book. And then aside from that, I've been telling people I'm rereading via audio Midnight Tides. That's Malazan Book of the Fallen book five. And having a really good experience with that. I am taking my time with that now. I started out re listening to the audiobook and just being floored. How much easier it was on reread having some context <laughs> that I didn't have the first time I read the book but um even though it felt like a very smooth experience initially I've gotten to a point in the book even though it's like where all the excitement starts to amp up in the storylines I just felt like at the same time I want to slow down again and I'm like oh man I need to stop this I don't know if I'll continue that or not I'm trying to do that because I was invited to a possible discussion on Midnight Tides so I was trying to refresh my memory since it's already been a couple of years since I got, I read that book, but I love that series. And I love that particular book in Malaz and Book of the Fallen because we're introduced to so many of my favorite characters. And I really love the themes that are explored in that story. 
the humor, the tragic storyline, but also just the imagery, the themes. There's so much there that I love. So now is is this a is this a full reread for you? Did you for some reason just start with Midnight Tides, or are you mm-hmm. reading rereading the whole series again? Because I know at the end of our conversation with um, Jimmy and Philip and um, and you and Alan, once we got off, we were talking about how I don't get Malazin and mm-hmm. that it's probably my fault. And, um, and, uh, <laughs> it, it could be my cognitive limitations, honestly, like other people who read it had such an easier time and enjoyed it so much more. And I'm just talking about gardens of the moon. Um, and I felt just like I had been beaten up or something. I, there were like mental bruises, um, just because I found it so dense and so difficult to read. And again, I'm someone who I like difficult books. Um, and I've read a lot of difficult literary books, but, um, it really beat me up and, um, and, and that sort of thing. But, uh, are you finding Joanna that on a second, on a reread that it's reading more smoothly and that you're devoting less of your mental energy to figuring out what's going on and more to kind of savoring, uh, the details Yes, it's such a different experience because I think I know there are a lot of discussions out there about Malazan being complex. Now I am way dumber than you, <laughs> Jordan. No. And I <laughs> no. maybe that's why I, I loved Garden to the Moon so much, because I just I didn't really overthink it. I was like, okay, there are things I don't really understand or know, but this is cool and I like this magic and this atmosphere is beautiful. And I I really loved just the overall the tone and mood of the story and the quirkiness of the characters. I always say that, but there's so much I loved that I didn't, that had nothing to do with understanding the plot. As we said earlier, like what uh, Jared was saying, I relate so well. I am not the most plot driven reader. I'm not. So if you want to learn about Malazan from like a plot perspective, I'm not your person. (laughs) I've looked back at my old videos and I'm like, I don't even know what I'm talking about. when I (laughs) try to explain these books. And so the way that I see this, uh, the, the complexity thing that people talk about, and actually I had a conversation with Alan recently, just an informal uh, boxer conversation with Alan about this, because I think like the one thing we were saying about it is that it's not, <sighs> the complexity of the story, I feel like has to do more with you, you not receiving all the context initially. He gives you things, but he doesn't give you the context for it. So then you read on and you read on and eventually you start little by little getting context, but you don't realize you're learning it. It's like learning a language. Like if you're immersed in a new language, of course, you're not going to really understand things at first. You might have a couple of words you can hang on to and you just kind of gravitate towards the words you understand. And little by little, you start recognizing um, this is pelo, you know, hair or whatever. You just start to kind of like as make associations after a while but you're not you know like even without trying it's gonna happen but then later on you go back and let's say you go back to the first location you started out in or whatever when you were immersed in a new language suddenly you're like i understand all these words and these i understand what people are saying and that that's so simple these are simple sentences but i didn't understand them because i didn't have the context and So I think it's a context thing more than anything that makes it challenging. And that's really valid as far as like feeling the series is complex. And I feel like the people who say it's not complicated, there are two reasons they say that. One, they've either either reread some of the books, either even just the first couple of books or even reread any of them, or they finished the series as a whole. Because I think if you finish the 10 books, like if you finish the 10th book, it's so easy to say, oh, it's not that hard. <laughs> but you don't recognize you're, you graduated grade 10. You can't say that to somebody who's at the beginning of a series that it's not that hard, I think. Now, there are some people who will say, will say it's not that hard anyway, you know, and that's fine. But I really think it's because you don't get all the context initially that makes it feel challenging. Yeah, I I really think it's me in this case. And I think that like, this is going to make me sound so dumb, but I, I really do feel like I need more handholding and mm-hmm. maybe I have a problem with my attention span. 
Um, I think it could be what I was saying to Philip after the last uh, time we all got together and, and uh, on, on my channel that I do think I have a very sort of linear um, mind. Um, I had this almost neurotic um, need to understand literally everything before I move to the next page. I read that way. And I think sometimes mm. that's why I read slowly. And with yeah. Erickson, it was giving me anxiety because I kept thinking I'm missing something. I didn't catch everything there was to catch. And so it ended up in this almost literary navel gazing where I was, you know, going back and staring at certain pages and it would take me like a half an hour. And I just wasn't comfortable not having everything up there locked in like a steel trap before I moved to the next chapter. And so it was this slow, painful, laborious process. And so maybe my issue is that I am a this this like Freudian like basket case neurotic who just cannot let go and trust the author. Um, no, yeah, I'm the same way though. Like I feel I feel like I could relate to your experience a lot, honestly. Uh, there, what I what happened to me? I make it sound like it was smooth. It was with Gardens of the Moon for me because for whatever reason, I just I don't know. I, I just like let it happen <laughs> and I was okay somehow I was okay knowing this is kind of complicated what a and shot I don't of get everything help? maybe yeah <laughs> let's try that no but no I really had the same struggle as I read on as I read on I was like okay my working memory is not that good where I can keep this in my mind as I read on and I'm introduced to like 10 other things happening because there are there are like several storylines going on and uh, for me, what I, my strategy, there were two things that I did, and I'm not saying it made it that easy because I was never fully comfortable. I was never fully comfortable reading this series as far as like my understanding of what was happening. I've never got there. I still am not comfortable 100% with all the things. And of course, there are books like, uh, what was it, that you get some context in other books. That's the other thing is that there, is, there are other books too in the world that explain more so I never totally got there. And in fact, Malazan is kind of challenging for me in a way because this is part of what I love about it, but it's also part of why it's challenging for me personally is that Erickson loves the wild magic. He loves to just throw out some weird wild stuff at you. And when I read stuff like that, I love it. But at the same time, after I finished reading it, I questioned, did I dream that? <laughs> did that? Did I read that or did I dream that? Yeah. Because yeah. I don't know. And that's, that was a struggle for me. <laughs> well, yeah. But I my strategy, of... I'm sorry, my strategy really quickly. So what I did was um, I took Andy Smith, who was here in the chat earlier. He has an amazing video about Malazan that I recommend to everybody. It changed my life reading, watching that video, honestly. And it's actually a very philosophy driven video where he talks about uh, the post postmodernism in Malazan or something. Mm -hmm. But basically the way that I approached the series, thanks to Andy, was I actually approached it by thinking of it more as a theme driven series than a plot driven uh -huh. or character driven series. Mm, so I didn't worry help. so much if I didn't remember every character, if I didn't understand the storylines, if I didn't understand how the magic worked or what was going on in the world. What I focused on was what do I think the themes that Erickson is trying to bring forth in this story. And Specifically, I think one of the ways that you can kind of figure this out, it's not the only way, but what kind of emotions are the characters experiencing? Are they feeling betrayed? Are they feeling confused? Or conf What are their conflicts? And the nice thing that Erickson does, and I think you see this more and more as you go on in the series, is you see that they are often dealing with, with multiple conflicts, that they're not, they're not just seeing, they're not singular, there are not singular conflicts in Malazan. There, there are characters that are dealing with with conflicting motivations all the time, but really looking at that. And then looking at it through that lens helped me to look at things like, oh, okay. So this series, like for example, this book might be doing like the book Midnight Tides, for example, one way to look at it is there is a theme, for example, of colonialism, I would say in that book, there's a, a theme of, man, there's family dynamics for sure. Brotherhood is explored in that book quite a bit. And uh, also capitalism is a huge theme in that book. And that was a that was particularly the book that got me to look at reciprocity, the con also the theme of reciprocity 
and how much we do things expecting something in return mm -hmm. and whether we're able to get past that. It made me very emotional reading how the characters grappled with that particular aspect of the story. And there's also great humor in the story too. So you don't have to look at it just as a theme driven experience. But for me, looking at the themes in a broader sense helped me to feel like I had some grounding in the story and mm -hmm. helped me kind of like be okay with like, okay, I don't understand half this stuff. I don't know if I dreamed half this stuff. I don't know if I'll remember half these characters yeah. later. But the interesting thing too, is that I'll say is that when you get into the second half of the series, at least for me, getting into the second half of the series, I did notice a shift and I did notice that I started, I, I did feel way more attached to characters. I did feel attached to characters in the beginning a little bit, but I became more and more attached for sure to certain characters that reappeared in the second half of the series. Well, that's encouraging. And that sounds like a very helpful approach for someone like me, because I'm a big theme person. Um, it needs to be thematically rich for me. Um, and I believe that about, I think the more thematically rich books are, the more teachable they are. I remember toward the beginning of my career, um, you know, uh, my school, whoever was principal at the time, this was when I was teaching in New York, she got the notion that, um, oh, well, students just don't connect with books because they're hard. And so what we're going to do is instead of having students read, you know, um, instead of having students read The Crucible, we're going to have them read this. And now I'm, I'm actually forgetting her name. Um, oh, what's her name? They're like, they're like somewhere between adult and young adult books, a female author. I'm forgetting what her, what her name is. Anyways, they're easier. They're very easy to read. They're kind of like beach reads. And we were forced to, to teach these, these books. And I found that it was more difficult to read. Uh, so Hunger Games, for example, I'm not knocking Hunger Games. That would be more difficult to teach than Shakespeare. Uh, with Shakespeare, there's a lesson in every single line. There is um, something to unpack in every single scene. And I f was finding that when I was reading this sort of airport book, um, when I was teaching that to students, I didn't even have questions to ask them after a chapter was over. They're just the text didn't evoke the sorts of critical questions that something like Shakespeare would. And so I found that paradoxically uh, that it was easier to teach Shakespeare or Milton's Paradise Lost than it was, or, you know, um, you know, Morrison's Beloved than it, than it was to teach something like, you know, some young adult book that, you know, uh, where the writing's a little more simple. Uh, and no that sort kidding. Of That's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, with Gardens of the Moon, um, uh, I felt like not to make, I know we got a lot of Malazan fans here. I felt like I was putting together Ikea furniture because <laughs> I was reading it. And then I would like, I would go and look up the instructions for how to read it. And then I would go to the wiki site and I would watch like a YouTube video. And it was it kind of broke up the sort of immersion. And so I'm just hoping at this point that someone will help me. Your, your help was the first step there. Read it thematically. Uh, yeah, that's, well, that's what I did. And I mean, there are so many more themes. I, I, it's funny because while you were talking, I'm like, oh, and I didn't mention this theme and this theme and this theme. <laughs> there are so many, and a lot of people will say compassion and compassion is one of the more prominent themes in the story for sure. It's important. But there are so many themes and it's not just a one-sided view of compassion. I think we talked about that on your live stream. Sorry. But Alan yeah, I think. Day with it. Oh, I know. Wasn't it I know. <laughs> I it was yes, it was Alan. Um, but you're not alone. There are a lot of people here in the chat who are saying that they had a very similar experience to you. And um, I don't know. That was just my approach. Another thing I did, and I did note take. And I did, honestly, I don't know how much that did for me, honestly, note taking. But maybe it did something. And I also tabbed my books. And I know that seems like a weird thing to do maybe, but what I did was if I noticed something and I have like a whole color coding system with my tabs, if anybody's interested in that, let me know. Maybe I'll do a video, but I did a tabbing system with my, my books. And when I finished the book, I would go back and talking about context again, I would go back to something I tabbed that felt like this feels like it might be thematic or it might be something important or something. 
And I go back to a previous tab and suddenly I'm like, oh, this connects to this or there's foreshadowing here and I didn't see this the first time. So you, I noticed that even with Gardens of the Moon when I did it, read it the first time, like I saw so many things that I didn't realize eventually but by tabbing it, I think that could also be a helpful approach personally too. Okay, we'll do. I'll give that a yeah. shot. I mean, I make my students annotate and many of them use tabs. I'm, if they can do I it, love I annotating. can do it. I love it. But I mean, it's like it's a it's it's like what you were saying too. There can be value in just not having having it all figured out, like what AP is saying here, that need to master information. I think that's important too. I know people talk about that. You were talking about poems earlier. And I know people talk about that with poetry all the time, that poems aren't riddles, you know what I mean, to be solved. It's not really like that. Or what the way you were talking about working with McCarthy's prose, like it's more just noticing what comes up for you. It's not, it's so different than other fantasy, I think, in that regard. It's it's sort of, it does require, I think, a different kind of approach. And you'll Although, find it. Students love the riddle aspect of it. I mm. totally agree with you and AP that that's not the way to do it. Um, but sometimes, you know, I'll be I'll be teaching a poem to students, and uh, the aspect and kids tend to like that. It feels like a game for them. It feels like it feels like a challenge. And you and it's not easy to get a room full of twenty five students who are seventeen years old to get really really into it and to lose themselves and for the time to go by really fast. But that poem as riddle, poem as puzzle, poem as a, a, a treasure box that they're trying to pry open, kids do love that. Um, and um, so maybe when they go off to college, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll become more sophisticated in the way that they read poems, but that can help. Uh, some some people to, to feel like you're grappling, you're struggling uh, with something, you're wrestling with it. Um, anyways. Yeah, I think there has to be a balance though too, right? <clears throat> like it has yeah. to feel like somewhat within their domain of ability. I think that's also yeah. a challenge too that a lot of people have is that, I mean, and that's the thing with Malazan too, I would say, is that Everybody who comes into it comes with different experiences, different ways of approaching literature or different ways of, you know, just different literacy levels too. And I think that's also going to play a role in how you experience the series, maybe, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. maybe in positive and negative ways. So mm -hmm. uh, like even like some people said, oh, I need, I've heard some people say, oh, I need to get more fantasy under my belt before I read this. And like, well, that could almost go against you because yeah. we're defying so many fantasy conventions in that book and I think for reasons like there are actually specific reasons so in some ways understanding more about fantasy it can help you understand why he's doing that or maybe explore or question why that he might be doing that and then in other ways like I said when I read Gardens of the Moon I don't think I was very well read at all in fantasy probably still am not but I I, I don't know I think that also helped me to kind of roll with it too mm. but I think everybody comes from a different place and that's the hard part is everybody's kind of, especially in this social media culture of books, we're all comparing ourselves to other people and thinking, well, they seem to get more than I'm getting out of this. And yeah. that must mean I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> uh, and it's really hard to work past that, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. See, like Matt's saying here. And I don't know. Yeah. It's just interesting how how that affects things. I would be curious, though, since you said that you teach you teach literature. Are you comfortable course, talking yeah. about that? Oh, of course. Yeah. What do yeah. you think? So what do you think about uh, literacy skills? Like, do you think I'm trying to actually, this is just a broader topic I'm kind of curious about is about how, how we acquire literacy skills. And do you think that literacy skills are declining over time? Like, I know that that's been a concern for a lot of people, a lot of educators. I hear about it all the time. Do you think literacy skills are declining over time or that there are certain influences in culture that are affecting that? Um, it's hard for me because I teach at a, an advanced charter school. I teach at a school called the Advanced Math and Science Academy uh, uh, in Massachusetts. And it is one of those schools that is self-selected. So the kids that go there, it's for it's a school for it's open to all. But but the kids who want to go there because the, t the town where my school is. There's another, there's a public school there. I mean, charter is public, but there is a regular public school there as well. And 
it ends up self-sorting into the kids that really love to learn and are just thirsty for knowledge. Um, my students are brilliant kids, um, and they go off to do amazing things. Um, so it's hard because now I did, I did teach at an urban school, uh, and you know, I had to be the tough urban teacher. I had to roll up my sleeves and you have to teach differently. Um, but I mean, this is going to sound like almost out of touch. I've had a great experience teaching students and I haven't seen much of a decline. Uh, I try to make my classes really engaging and I try to work with kids at all different levels and they just end up getting into it. And yeah, I think one of the biggest concerns I have is the decline of the ability to engage in unadulterated long-term focusing. So kids have a much more difficult time these days. And when I say these days, what I'm, don't mean is that I am like shitting on modern current, our contemporary students, our current students. It's, it's actually that my parents would have been exactly like this. Were they situated in the environment and culture that they are in with all of these pressures, uh, with all of this competition on their attention spans? Uh, yeah, like, you know, my, um, my uncle was able to focus and read for long periods of time when he was in school because there was nothing distracting him. Uh, and these kids have, you know, uh, video games and social media, and many of them have like real social media addictions that any of us would have had if we had co developed uh, cognitively in the age that they're developing cognitively. So they're dealing with a set of challenges that I didn't have to deal with growing up. Um, I don't, I, I find it pretty easy to sit down and focus for a long period of time on a work of literature and get fully immersed in it. <clears throat> I've had open, really sort of open, free wheeling, rambling conversations with students where we'll just set aside, you know, 15 minutes of class, 20 minutes. And I have students telling me that they just can't do this anymore, that they have the, the inability to stop checking their phone or to set it aside and turn everything off and just lose themselves in a book. And what's interesting is you would think kids would be like, um, who cares about that anyway, old man? They're not. They like universally are like, I wish I could do that, Mr. Hill. I wish, I wish I, why can't I do that? What's wrong with me? Um, and so, and I know Jared's made videos about this. There is actually a way of doing this. And I, so I try to be optimistic about that. You can do this. Uh, as Jared has put it in one of his videos, it, your, your brain is like a muscle. Your, your cognitive faculties are like muscles. You have to exercise them. Yes, it sucks going to the gym when you are um, just first starting to work out. Yeah, it's painful and it's difficult and you're gonna wanna give up early uh, and you're, you're not gonna wanna push through and you're gonna get uh, distracted by other things. Um, but I do tell them to you know chunk it out and start, start small. Try to sit down and read for 20 minutes you're a human being with a nature that is the same as my own. You are capable of sitting down and reading for 20 minutes without any distractions. You can do it. I promise go outside, sit under a tree and just read for 20 minutes. And then if you feel like continuing to read, Oh my gosh, amazing. You're getting it. Keep going. But if you're feeling really antsy, get up the 20 minutes. That was a victory. Read for 20 minutes a day for the next month. Uh, and then, and then bump it up to 25 minutes and then to 30 minutes. Uh, so I think they can do it. And I, I tell them that I think that the, the people of the future who will have the richest, most meaningful and most successful lives will be the first people in the future who are able to grapple with that distraction. The most successful, most uh, people who have the, the, you know, the richest inner lives, the, the richest uh, intellectual lives will be those who are capable of navigating the information overload and the constant titillations that we're being fed. I mean, it is just impossible. Like I would never get a TikTok account because I don't think I'd be able to stop scrolling. And so, um, so anyways, yeah. I tried to approach it from the, this very human perspective. Um, and maybe it's the way that I teach, but I'm not having problems with them in class. They're great, man. When we read Shakespeare together in class, they are into it and we act it out and we have a great time and we're making meaning of the text, but, um, they are dealing with forces that are bigger than them, that are bigger than my ability to solve it as a, 
as a teacher. So yeah, I'm noticing a big difference in this current generation with how much they really care. I mean, I think every generation cares, obviously, right? But oh, you're a I music am, teacher, right? You're a, you're a teacher as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I I know. So there are a few things that are coming to mind. Um, I don't know. I just feel something different uh, with this whole situation too, because. The, well, actually, okay. I want to mention two nonfiction books I recently read. One I don't really highly recommend. I kind of ranted about it a little bit on my channel. Um, I, but it's still worthwhile for people who are interested in the topic. I shouldn't totally negate the book at all because I did get some value out of it. But there was a book that I read called Stolen Focus. And it's basically why you can't pay attention and how to get your focus back, which is a lie. You don't really, he doesn't really give you any strategies how to get your attention back. And I read your review basically of that, tells you at the end. Yeah. It was an update He's, video. I watched it. It was very mm -hmm. good. Yeah. But in that particular book, I thought it was interesting. The prologue, he's, he's very hyperbolic, this author, but he talked about, um, he talked about the fact that he talked about something in the prologue about how, that there is going to be a divide, a possible divide in the future between people possibly of upper class versus lower class. I'm not sure exactly how this divide would happen socially, mm -hmm. where people who are conscious of this problem will have the resources or the wherewithal or education, whatever it is, to do things like app limits. Or I do that, mm -hmm. by the way. I have app limits on all my devices, <laughs> and I don't spend more than eight minutes on social media on my phone a day but wow, awesome. or they do certain things yeah they do certain things to kind of limit their exposure to to constant scrolling or do things like that and there are some people who might not have the resources he thinks or the education or the understanding about these tools or awareness of how this is affecting them yes where or maybe they're under more stressful circumstances and this is going to be more easily addictive as a result of that where we're going to see a divide between those two between oh, maybe people who lack can, of Part, part of it, I think it's, a, it's, it's such a big thing and it's, it's actually like, it's not a univariate thing. Uh, it's a multivariate analysis on this. So I think what you say is absolutely true. What you read in the book, that is, is absolutely yeah. true that look, if you're a single mom and you're struggling to get by and you're working two jobs and you get home and you have to make dinner and you have to do a million different things and take care of everything, the laundry, you're just running this very complicated operation. Yeah, I, I totally get why parents like that would stick their an iPad in front of their kid or yeah. just give the kid their phone to play with. Uh, so if you don't have the, the resources, there's some of that too. But I think we also can, I think, um, I think we need to also look at the environments because you're exactly right. There is a class divide on this. So I'll give you an example. When I was teaching- He did talk at, about environment, by the way. Yeah, this environment yeah. piece is big. Yeah, yeah, it's big because when I was teaching at uh, Chicopee, and I know this, I don't want to commit um, uh, anecdotal fallacy here, but um, in my experience, when I was teaching at an urban school, the, the school, and this is like a very like wonky, nuanced educational policy stuff, once an once a school becomes a high need school, Massachusetts has different levels that they categorize schools at. So a level one school is a school that's performing super well. Uh, kids are acing the standardized tests. There's a bunch of different metrics. It's a level one school. They're doing awesome. Mm -hmm. Then there's level two. Then there's level three. I started teaching at this urban school the year that it transitioned from a level three school to a level four school. And once you're a level four school, the base, the state essentially takes over the school uh in in a way that people are really surprised to hear and once the state takes over the school they actually start setting some of the rules and the rules are set by bureaucrats that are really not even part of education so this, the urban school that i worked at they had a very lax cell phone policy kids were allowed to have their cell phones in class um they had to have them flipped over onto their desk so that their screen wasn't facing them um but the teacher could give instructions and say, you can use your phone for this lesson or whatever. Um, and it was a nightmare because kids could not stop looking at their phones. They would sneak and look at it. And this school had a demerit policy where if you screw up like five times, then that gets elevated to a different level of punishment. And you only get any kind of real punishment. Once you hit like nine infractions, you get this like very complicated system of uh, demerits because the state was trying to, for reasons of equity and things like that, they were trying to uh, essentially manufacture better outcomes for the school in a way. It's like, that's not the way to do it though. They were doing it in a clumsy, awkward way. 
when I left there and started teaching at uh, AMSA, which is where I teach now, this is a wealthy area. It is a an elite suburb outside of Boston. The parents do not give their kids technology on, on the main. Uh, the school has a very strict no cell phone policy if you're even caught using it in the halls. Um, that's big trouble. And it works wonders. And I know this is controversial. There are some teachers that say, oh, absolutely not. The cell phone's a learning tool. Well, under the right conditions, it's a learning tool. Uh, usually not. Usually it's a distraction. Um, and so our classrooms become this this sanctuary of just of just learning. And it's this unique sacred space where kids have to put their phones away and just engage in these really authentic human just learning interactions. It's like I'm 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 at Plato's Academy or something like that. The the conditions really aren't that different except I have like an overhead board and I have all this technology at my disposal. So um this school has a has a set of very strict uh, policies. The parents are on board. They don't want their kids distracted by their phones during class. Look, they're going to get out of school. They're going to use their phones. They're going to do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They're going to do it anyways. But in class, we have this beautiful uh, set of conditions wherein students are actually able to set it down and learn. And when you create a culture like that, even when they go to lunch, for example, we'll, we'll let, let them use their phones at lunch while they're eating if they want to, they don't even do it. Because yeah. they're so used to not doing it and human to human interactions are not awkward for them. And they're able to look each other in the eye and uh, just be present. And so um, I think there are institutional aspects of this uh, in addition to the class things and the uh, anyways, I'm, I'm yeah, no, I, I love what you're saying, though. Absolutely. And it's inter it, this is actually one of the big problems that I see, too. I think one of the biggest problems with this whole entire situation is that so much of so many teachers, so much of education is now thinking, well, we can't beat it. So let's join it. Let's put our classes, let's have all these technology resources. Yes. Let's email the students. My blood pressure let's, is rising already. Yeah. yeah let's <laughs> get on reason. Facebook with them. Let's, yeah. you know, I know that there's some boundaries there, but I, I think there's a lot that's like being thrown at them, not just from their culture, but also from school. Like, oh, did you, you didn't check your email to get that assignment in or do this. And it's, yeah. how are they supposed to have boundaries with it? If like their academic work is reliant on that. that I say that. Totally and I, true. I understand that. I understand the need for it too. <laughs> so it's, it's complicated. Yeah. I'm not saying it's su super black and white in that regard, but the fact that you are able to have your classroom as a sanctuary in that way, I think is so good. It's so helpful. Um, this is also something I read in another nonfiction book too recently. I I uh, listened on audiobook to a nonfiction book called Good Anxiety by this neuroscience professor. And so I was really excited to hear her perspective on anxiety from a neuroscience standpoint, because I love, I love learning about neuroscience, at least at a very elementary level. I love learning how the brain works. I love neuroplasticity. And she was talking about in one particular part of the book about working memory. So working memory is that part of your brain where if you're focusing on a task, you're able to keep certain ideas or thoughts in your mind as you're doing a task. That's very, I mean, it's kind of like what we we're talking about with audiobooks and fantasy. That's why listening to audiobooks, uh, fantasy audiobooks is really challenging. I would say, unless you have a very well-developed working memory and you can keep the names and the places and the world building in your mind yep. as you're listening, that's hard to do in my, for me. <laughs> Yeah. But it's easier oh, yeah. for some people to do, and they might just have a better working memory. Uh, but I'm very good at listening to audiobooks. So to your point, that all of that is true about audiobooks versus reading with your eyes. Again, uh, I know that some aspects of the learning styles research has been kind of debunked, but mm -hmm. I do still yeah. think that uh, some of it's true in the sense that I am excellent at listening to audiobooks. So for whatever yeah. weird reason, I am about just as good at listening to audiobooks as I am reading with my eyes. Oh yeah. Things just mm -hmm. lock in there and I like listening and something about being maybe I'm I maybe no. I'm ancient Greek. Maybe I'm 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 I've got an I old totally soul believe you. where I'm I'm good at listening to oral stories being told by a compelling narrator, but it works for me. Uh oh yeah somehow. Yeah. My mom is the same way and it's so weird because my mom just recently 
started listening to audiobooks in her 70s. But she is, she's gifted at it. Like, you know, she actually listened to Stoner alongside me. And I mean, she could talk about various literary techniques and subtext and metaphor. And uh, one time I read over the phone a Baker passage. She said, oh, wow, I love his personification technique with this and that. I'm like, what? How did you capture what? <laughs> I barely even caught what I was saying. And I was the one speaking it out loud. And she could do that. And I read her Jenny Wirtz recently. And she was talking about the rhythm. She said, oh, she has a very unusual rhythm to her prose. She could catch all that just via audio. Like some people just have a gift with their audio skills for sure. And I, I do attribute it. I do wonder if some of it's working memory related. I wonder if that's the part of the brain that's activated. But in any case, in this particular book that I was listening to, she was talking about how like with teenagers, the big challenge with them, especially with this generation that we're talking about, a lot of them have, for whatever reason, whether it's they've been socialized to do this or programmed in some way through whatever messaging, who knows, they they tend to be people who will go back and forth between tasks. So they might be listening to a podcast one minute on their phone or watching a video on, on YouTube and switch to TikTok. Then they'll switch to their Kindle e-reader. Then they'll switch to this app, you know, all within the span of a half hour, they might do a little bit of reading and then switch to another task and then switch to another task in short succession. And she was talking in the book and she used kind of like a, a pseudonym, an anecdote of how this would work where there's a teenage girl and she was really struggling with her homework. Her grades are going down. And her mom said, we're going to take your phone away. She's like, no, I'm fine. I just go back and forth between tasks. And she said, no, we need to do this. So they took the phone away from her study time everything improved. Her grades just completely shot up. Everything improved because her working memory improved. Yeah. And her working memory improved because she was no longer trying to go between all these different tasks on her phone. It's the multitasking yeah. thing, which of course we know we can't multitask, but what people think of multitasking is like switching between tasks in quick succession. Yes. And I think that's part of the, again, I think sometimes we need to be the adults in the room and I think sometimes, yeah, there's that person in the faculty meetings who raises their hand and just says, no, actually, none of this is a problem. In fact, these are just these are just different creatures who are different than humans have always been throughout history for the last 10,000 years. These are the first people in the history of the world who are who excel when they're being constantly distracted by things that take them out of their focus. And I'm like, no. Um, no, they're not actually different than you and I were. And, you know, and again, there's good research by his name is very difficult to pronounce. Chicksamahaili. Oh, yes. Uh, I love his. I love Flo. I own that Flo. book. Yeah. I know that sounds like a like a very like 1960s buzzword. Flo, man. But um, he's talking <laughs> about getting in the zone while you're learning yeah. and Flo um, theory. being sucked in and the, the way in which just it's like being in the zone in basketball or being in the pocket when you're a bass player. You're just operating, you're firing at all cylinders mm -hmm. and you're, you're, nothing's uh, interrupting the learning process and you're just in it, man, 100% focus. And I actually think the conditions have to be right to foster that. Um, well, he talks and, about that. There are various specific components of flow for sure. It's like yeah. one of them is feedback is immediate. Your goals are clear. Uh, you're asking higher order thinking questions. You feel like some sense of control in the task. The situation can't be too difficult. Otherwise yeah. it'll be too anxiety producing. It can't be, be too, too easy. easy or you'll be bored. And actually that's what this book, Good Anxiety, she talked about flow in that book too, because she was talking about anxiety levels. Actually, you do need some level of anxiety in order to perform a task optimally. It's a big oh, yeah. myth that you should get rid of it completely or that it's a total enemy. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I knew that already, but, <laughs> but it yeah. was just really cool. But no, I love, yeah, but there are certain conditions and there's a lot, I think flow theory, chick, chick, chick sent me high. I think is how you say his name, <laughs> but he definitely was the groundbreaker for illustrating all these different conditions of flow and what are the various components of flow and how flow can operate in various ways in your life. But the flow, flow theory is still a thing. Like People are still researching it all the time. I think it's actually gone the neuroscience level too. So that's pretty cool. Mm. Thank you so much, AP, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here. I owe him um, an email. I forgot. I have to, I have to, I owe him an email. So yeah, I'm just going to quickly, 
catch up on some of these uh, comments really quickly. Cell phones are a library of inadequate, unimportant data, data and poor art. <laughs> How can you look at a picture with any quality on an itty bitty cell phone? That is a good point phone? in the sense that I'll have students who say, yeah, oh, Mr. Hill, you told me to go home and watch Godfather 2. I did it, Mr. Hill. I, I did you, you watched it on your television, right? Like you, your little home theater. Oh no, I watched it on my cell phone. I'm like, you have a home theater? Yeah. You watched it on your cell phone? Okay. Watch it again. Um, anyways, you have kids watching like Dune on their little tiny, uh, devices. And I'm just like, how do you, it's pretty <laughs> it's mind blowing the same experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know what Evie is talking about. Is there a bot in the chat or something? She oh, says, AMSA, she says, is oh, it's in the, the town, town where I work. Where I work. Oh, wow. Hey, Marlboro, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. I don't live there, um, so I commute in. But um, wow, that's like, what a small world. Cool. And then the that environment is also predicated on valuing education in general, the importance of learning. Yeah, I, I understand that totally. Um, the best way to listen to audiobooks is to close your eyes and open your mind's eye. That's really cool. You know what? I've noticed because I'm very much somebody who visualizes what I read. I noticed, I've noticed that listening to audiobooks sometimes interferes with that. Not all the time, but sometimes I find I visualize a little easier if I'm reading visually. I'm not sure exactly why that would be the case. Um, the way people can split their attention while listening to audiobooks blows me away. Well, sometimes I mean, it can, now, it can happen. I'm not sitting. I'm, I'm going for a yeah. walk or I'm exercising or I'm in the car or I'm doing dishes. So not yeah. always sitting necessarily. Yeah. I listen to audiobooks too. Um, just depends on what the audiobook is. There are various variables involved as to how I engage with audiobooks. But I do love cleaning and uh, listening to audiobooks. For some reason, that combination works for me personally. Um, I have, to, or, or walking, walking is wonderful too. Doing something. Yeah. Just uh, doing something often helps. And yeah, <laughs> I've not listened to uh, oh, that gra a graphic, graphic audio novels? and audio. Hmm. Graphic novels. Yeah. I don't know. I bought my nephew's glow. He must have read it. bought some of now, Csikszentmihalyi's work to, for the his book. Nephews. Yeah, the book Flow by Csikszentmihalyi. I read that uh, a, lot, a while back, like 12, 11, 13. I feel like I read everything. I, everything I talk about that I've read a while back was like in the same time frame. It's really weird. <laughs> but <laughs> but with that particular book, I, it was very, very powerful. Me, what, what he said about the experience, not only of losing yourself in flow, losing your sense of self-consciousness. Like oh, you're yeah. no longer self-conscious. You're no longer worried about what you look like or, you know, am I happy or what you're feeling? You know, your self-consciousness, you transcend all of that when you're in a flow state. You're just one with whatever the experience is. Mm -hmm. But he said that when you come back, you actually have, you have a greater sense of self as a result of that, that you expand the concept of who you think you thought you were mm -hmm. after you have the flow experience. And as soon as I read that, I was like, that is why I do what I do. That is why I teach. That is what I want to help people expand the concepts of who they think they are. Like that is the most profound thing in the world to me. So beautifully said. Book. Yeah. I mean, like, but, yeah, what's that? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, like, you know, I, I've said this to my students, like you can't, you can't play like you can't play basketball like Michael Jordan game seven of the finals. If you're navel gazing or staring down at your hands, like what is, you know, do I even exist, man? Like you have to be in that flow state to perform at your best. You have to, um, you, you can't be, you know, waxing self-consciously, uh, about whether or not you're going to make this three point jump shot and what it's going to mean if you don't and all you have to be just in the zone. And I think you're right. I think that's why I like teaching as well is because I'm in the zone all day. Yeah, I love that experience. But I also love the idea that like when your students, for example, that concept of expanding the concept of who you think you are too. Like I love the idea that they maybe, maybe they read Shakespeare, a Shakespeare sonnet. And they thought beforehand, oh, I could never get into Shakespeare. And then they read it and they have this profound experience or this life altering way of seeing the world and it expands them and they that expands not only their view the experience itself 
but also their expansion of self is also expanded by the fact that I can appreciate Shakespeare. What else does this mean? I can appreciate. Can I, yes. can I appreciate other types of, of, of literary classics? I, I like that aspect of it too. Um, but I was going to say about flow of the book is that I don't think it's the best reading experience. <laughs> all that said, I found it a little bit, I don't know. I found his prose and maybe because it's a translated work. I found the prose um, just a little stilted. It, it, it kind of Education feels like. Education writing is notoriously Yeah. Bad. Yeah. Ironically. But it, it feel, and it feels like, but it feels almost, it doesn't feel like modern education writing either. It feels, feels like a product of its time. Like it's aged a bit, a little archaic in the sense. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. It wouldn't, I don't know if it's the best reading experience ever, but it's still got some valuable, important information in it for sure. I did a video on it too. If anybody wants to check that out too, where I kind of break it down a little bit. Uh, Jordan, if you play bass, you and my husband need to meet. He's a bass player as well. I do play bass, but mostly guitar. Um, but but I do play. Well, if you play guitar, you also necessarily play bass because it's just the first four strings essentially. Uh, so, but yeah, um, I do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's cool. That's very cool. And here we have John Kevin Brown said, "I just finished Faithful in the Fallen series and loved it. Cool. I have not read that series, but I'm glad that you. Oh, I'm surprised you haven't, it. Joanna. That would. I know. That, that well, there's a been... lot of holes in my reading. There's there are a lot of holes in my reading. Me too. So I definitely need to. I I find myself. Um, I do want to continue. Actually, I started his Bloodsworn Saga series. So I read The Shadow of the Gods, but I haven't read The Hunger of the Gods, which is the sequel that's out now. Uh, and maybe I'll get to it at some point. Uh, but since it's an unfinished series, I guess maybe I'm putting it off a little bit. <laughs> and I have so yeah. much to read. I have so much oh. to read, including the books that Evie is constantly telling me to read, like The Spirit Cuts Through Water. Sorry, Evie. Yeah, I mean, I read Malice and I loved it. I had a great oh, did time. You? I did. Yeah. I had a great time. Again, you know, it was like, it was like, it was easy reading and it wasn't, it wasn't like high art or anything like that, but I had yeah. a great time. It was a cheeseburger, as uh, as um, as Philip told me that AP said. Uh, mm -hmm. Cheeseburger. It's a cheeseburger. It's easy to read. It's pretty simple. Um, there's nothing really deep, but it's a good time. I had a blast reading it, and like you said, I would go on to the next book, but now I have to read John Williams. You so. do. You have to. You have to. And who am I? Like, I'm trying to be a fantasy booktuber. and I'm just a, always promoting John Williams and then reading McCarthy. I don't yeah. know who I am yeah. anymore. And yes, I do need to to continue with my Essel Mott books. That's the other Molazen author. So, well, Jordan, this has been so much fun. I just looked at the time and we're like getting close to pushing two three hours. hours and 45 minutes close to there. Yeah. Pushing under three hours. Uh, so I want to be mindful of time and everything, but did you have any final thoughts or anything you wanted to share? Was no, uh, please subscribe to my channel. If you liked some of the stuff we were talking about today, uh, nothing much else. I just really appreciate you having me on Joanna. You're one of my favorite booktubers. I try wow. not to miss your videos. Uh, if I don't comment sometimes it's be probably because I'm in the car. Um, so the ones that I do comment on, I'm like erasing the board on my, in my classroom after school. And I'm playing that out loud. Um, so sometimes students will walk in and there's a Joanna video on, but, um, <laughs> I'm uh, very flattered. I, I really appreciate you having me on. This was a lot of fun. I wish Jared could have stayed longer, but it was really nice to have him for 50, 50 minutes. And, um, just thanks again. Yeah. Well, my pleasure. I'm honored and I love your channel so, so much. I also Thank try you. to catch all your videos and it's the same thing too. And also, yes, Jordan is reading Baker's Prince of Nothing trilogy, and he has a fantastic review for book one. So I recommend everybody checking that to check that out. And I really love his reviews in general because he not only provides an excellent overview of the books that he reads, but he also has a section in his reviews now called The Big Idea, where he connects it to some kind of bigger idea, either in philosophy or just some other bigger top topic. And I really appreciate that. 
Well, I mean, now that you're giving me praise, I'm going to send it right back to you. Subscribe mm -hmm. to Joanna's channel. <laughs> this is your first video that you've clicked on of hers because her reviews are so thoughtful. She has the best taste in literature. Uh, she wow. has this thoughtful, contemplative, reflective way in which she does these uh, book reviews. And she just seems to hit on uh, there, it's, you know, there are some authors where you wouldn't change a word of it. That's kind of like Joanna's videos. They're little works of art. So uh, definitely check, check some, press the subscribe button. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it so much. And thank you everybody in the chat. I'm sorry that I couldn't get to every single one of your comments because I really appreciated what everybody said. Oops. Hold on, sorry. There's something weird in my screen. But it was a pleasure to talk here with Jordan and earlier with Jared as well. And I'll have both channels linked in the description below. And until then, thank you, everybody, and have a great rest.